From Kern Government Television, welcome to this week's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting, originating from the County Administrative Center located at 1115 Truxton Avenue, Bakersfield, California. Kern County's vision is to create and maintain a customer-centered county government designed to garner the confidence, support, and trust of the people we serve. Today's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting will convene momentarily. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday, July 10 meeting of the Kern County Board of Supervisors. The board will reconvene. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Supervisor Gleason? Here. Supervisor Scribner? Here. Supervisor Magger? Here. Supervisor Couch? Here. Supervisor Perez? We're going to have the flag salute in just a moment. We're uh, very pleased and honored this morning to have the flag salute led by Josh Dannens, who is the Veteran Services Manager for the County of Kern, a Purple Heart uh, veteran in our community, and we're grateful for that. Uh, after that, we're going to remain standing for a moment uh, for a moment of prayer, silence, and meditation. I'd like you to remember this morning, we're going to remember somebody at the beginning of the meeting and somebody else at the end of the meeting today. Uh, I'd like you to remember during the time of prayer, silence, and meditation, uh, Lonnie Shelton, who was a great ambassador for Kern County. Uh, some say the best athlete who ever came out of Kern County. He died Sunday at the age of 62, and he was my friend. So I would like us to remember him today. Would you please rise, Mr. Dennis? Would you please do the fly salute? <coughs> Salute, pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, Josh, for the flag salute. <clears throat> We're going to begin this morning with our consent items. Consent items are indicated on your agenda, and by the way, copies of the agenda are at the back of the room and just inside the front doors there as you come in. Consent items are considered to be routine by staff and therefore uh, non-controversial, so they are suggested by staff to be voted on all at once. A consent item is indicated on the agenda with a CA above the item number. And uh, if you are a member of the public and have a question about uh, one of those items on consent, I'll give you an opportunity in a moment to ask that question, and then it'll be up to the, a member of the Board of Supervisors to decide whether or not that item is pulled from consent. Consent items start on page two of this morning's agenda with item number four, and then items seven and eight. On page three, all the items nine through 16. On page four, all the items 17 through 26. On page five, items 27 through 30, and then 32 through 35. On page six, items 36 through 41, and then item number 43, and then on page seven, items 44 and 45. Are there any members of the public who have a question about any of those items that are indicated to be on consent this morning? I don't see anyone, so I'll return to the board. Colleagues, do you have a, a comment or do you want to pull anything, or is there a motion to proceed with the consent calendar? Motion on consent. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. We have a second, Madam Clerk, so would, would you like us to voice, give a voice vote? Yes, please. Our, the voting machine isn't working. Thank you. All those in favor of the, uh, approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Is anybody opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries all ayes. Madam Clerk, will we follow that format for all the votes this morning? I'm going to try and fix this while, while we're on the next item. So I'll call for voice votes until you tell me otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we go on to page two of our agenda, and it is, uh, we have three uh, proclamations to present this morning. The first is going to be presented by Supervisor Gleason, and it is a proclamation proclaiming July 2018 as Purple Ribbon Month in Kern County. Supervisor Gleason. Motion or proclamation? Second. Please, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Is anybody opposed? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. The vote is all ayes. Great morning, a great uh, work with top, uh, a topic to talk about. Um, I have a proclamation in front of me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Board of Supervisors of Kern County, State of California, officially proclaiming July 2018 as Purple Ribbon Month in Kern County. And it has been signed by our Honorable Chair, uh, Supervisor Chairman Maggart. What this is about 
is to advise the board of plan events to highlight the importance of keeping kids safe in and around cars. cars. Uh, July is designated as Purple <laughs> Ribbon Month to educate and increase public awareness of the dangers of leaving children in motor vehicles. So I got a story to tell, and I was just telling Heidi about this a little, little while ago, is that a uh, <clears throat> long time ago, I remember my son and I went to the store to buy something. I don't know what we were going to buy, buy something. And I left him in the truck, an old beater that I had, and I went in to buy the milk or the whatever it was. When I come out, the truck slipped out of gear and rolled across, downhill across the parking lot. And I was screaming and yelling and running out. No accident, nothing happened. My son was fine. My wife found out about three years later when I had the courage to tell her. The point of that story is the fact that I wanted everybody to know I'm a good parent. I was a pretty darn good parent. I was very conscientious. I took care of my kids. I, I, I raised them as best I could. And that happened. And I think it's a blind spot that we are all vulnerable to, no matter who you are, no matter how, what quality of parent you are. This is not about bad parents and bad situations. This is about good parents in good situations that make dumb mistakes or forget things. And we are all prone to that. So I think it's time, I think it's appropriate that we take a moment to sit back and think our, about our own vulnerabilities, our own situations, and uh, find ways to not just sit back and say, hey, I'm a good parent, it's not going to happen to me. Baloney. It's going to happen to us. And we need to be on our toes all the time. And Heidi, I, I mean, I'd like Dina to pass it off to you to take this. I'll take that. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Supervisor Gleason. Good morning, Chairman Maggard and members of the board. Thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to bring awareness to Caitlin's Law again this year and to educate the community about the dangers um, of car safety. Um, my name is Dina Murphy, and I'm the director for Department of Human Services. And the Caitlin's Law was um, established for Caitlin Russell, who was left in the car by a caregiver. She was just an infant and subsequently um, died. And now, Caitlin's Law makes it a citable defense to leave a child under the age of six years um, alone um, a, a, a crime. So I, I think I came to you last year, and, and it was the day after a woman had left a three-year-old in the car in our parking lot for one hour at 99 degrees. And thank God for um, a cloud cover, because the child didn't die, but an entire hour in the car. The day after I made the presentation at the board, a mother carried an infant into the department and left a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, and five-year-old locked in her car. After about 40 minutes, they were found by a good Samaritan, but because the two-year-old was jumping in the front seat. But um, you know, the, it, it, is, it is so very dangerous, and we lose these little ones, and I, I know you probably heard about the child that was lost to the elements on Sunday in Sacramento, and that little three-year-old gained access to a car and uh, closed herself in and, and passed. So, um, you know, we're not alone as we strive to get this message out. And look, I have an incredible team of superheroes behind me. I've got, um, well, I don't have with us today. We have our Sheriff Donnie Youngblood. Um, we have Roland Meyer, who is the director of First Five and funds our, um, some of our awareness efforts through First Five. Brian Marshall, our Kern County um, uh, fire chief and Nick Cohen, our uh, animal services director. And all of these folks are out in the field, many of them first responders. Already this year, we've lost 21 uh, little children to, to um, hypothermia, including two in California. We're unfortunately three ahead of the number last year. We ended last year with a total of, of 49 um, dead children. So this is so very real, and it happens, it happens. I, I wish I wasn't putting on this purple and outfit and coming to you every year and telling you that uh, this is something that we, we you know, we, we're not making good ground on. And so please, you know, the awareness, look. And, and for those folks coming out of grocery stores and finding little children in the car or, you know, we all pass car windows, and I say this every year, many of these happen in, in grocery lots. So, you know, if, as you're passing and you're headed in, um, look into the back of those windows. And also, as a parent, you know, we, we just don't walk out of a car without our cell phone. Leave your cell phone in the uh, back, back seat with the babies, you know, car seat. 
So um, on Wednesday the 18th, we're gonna have a um, press conference with our partners. We're gonna be at Bakersfield College and we'll be demonstrating how the temperature rises in increments during uh, our press conference and it's really alarming to see how fast that temperature gauge goes up. The other thing that we'll do is um, have little children from the preschool <coughs> participate in um, looking back in an SUV, we actually stacked 19 children behind an SUV before you could actually see one of them. So there, there are car dangers that uh, parents really need to be aware of. We thank you again for bringing awareness, and I thank the partners behind me who are diligently out there every day helping us um, with this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Gleason. Next, we're going to proclaim July 15 through 21 as Probation Services Week in Kern County, and this presentation will be made by Supervisor Scrivener. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Motion to approve proclamation. Second. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved. Four eyes, one absent. Supervisor Perez. And Mr. Chairman, for the record, I would like to call the vote on the consent agenda and item one over again because I failed to say that uh, the vote was four eyes, one absent, Supervisor Perez on both of those motions. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to bring your troops down or? We got a lot. I guess we'll see how those stand up, I guess. Okay, all right. <laughs> What's going on? Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. It's my honor to be um, before you today. Um, every day, Kern County probation officers and juvenile corrections officers work on the front lines with probationers to hold them accountable for crimes they have committed against our families, friends, neighbors, and community. These offenders also implement vital, I'm sorry, these officers also implement vital services to reduce recidivism and break the cycle of reoffending. The Kern County Probation Department plays a pivotal role within the justice system, collaborating with virtually every social service and law enforcement agency. Probation officers are problem solvers, crime prevention specialists, motivators, educators, facilitators, and oftentimes are the only support system an offender may have. Not only do our probation officers serve others through their profession, they are also actively involved in their community from coaching youth sports programs to participating in a variety of governing boards throughout the county. Using the continuum of services provided through different methods of prevention, intervention, suppression, and incarceration, the Kern County Probation Department is working diligently every day to achieve our motto, commitments to a safe community. I know that all of our uh, members of the board are grateful to the men and women of the probation department, and so it's my honor to present this proclamation today to T.R. Miracle, who is our probation chief, and I know he has a lot of troops that are in the audience here today. It's great to see um, all those tan shirts. The Board of Supervisors of the County of Kern State of California has officially proclaimed July 15th through the 21st, 2018 as Probation Services Week in Kern County, and this recognition has been entered into the official board minutes. It's signed by our Honorable Chairman, Mike Maggard. I'd like to present this to our Chief. Come on up. Thank you. you Appreciate bet. it. Thank you, Supervisor Scrivener, Chairman Maggard, members of the board. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the board for the support of our department. I also want to thank the CAO's office, Mr. Alsop, and our uh, analyst, Brent Curry. You know, we uh, really work great together, and I appreciate uh, their help in accomplishing our mission. Um, as chief, what I really appreciate, though, is an opportunity to recognize my staff. Probation plays a vital role in the criminal justice systems that many may not be aware. After the arrest, after the prosecution, the probation department touches all of these cases whether it be for a court referral for a juvenile or felony sentencing report, of which we did over 5,000 last year, or if it's if an offender is placed on supervision in the community, of which we supervise over 9,000 adult felony offenders, over 2,000 of which are because of AB 109. We also supervise over 1,500 juvenile offenders. 
or if it's because one of our juveniles have been placed in one of our three detention facility. Probation plays a role in all of these and much more. Probation's mission is to help make a safer community by our dual roles of accountability and opportunity. Supervising offenders in the community is extremely important to ensure they're not reoffending. Unfortunately, many offenders do not take advantage of their grant of probation. By having a proactive community presence, we are able to respond quickly to these offenders. An example of this was in May when officers from our high-risk offender unit did a routine home call in a house in Taft. The probationer had search terms for narcotics and was also a sex offender registrant. During the search, a fishing tackle box was located. Inside, a large amount of suspected marijuana. A locked safe was also located. These were booked into evidence. Through investigation, it was learned that the owner of the safe was already in custody for transporting 40 pounds of methamphetamine from Mexico to the United States. As this was a federal investigation, the DEA was called and a search warrant was ordered. Over 450 grams of methamphetamine and $17,000 were located. The probationer is now pending numerous drug sale charges. Our over 160 armed officers are making the community safer every day by holding people accountable for their actions. However, our role is also to provide people an opportunity to turn their lives around. We can ensure longer term public safety by breaking the cycle of recidivism. An example of this is Carlos, a 36 year old male probationer. He was involved in gangs since he was 13 years old. He was in and out of the criminal justice systems, including four prison terms for serious offenses. In 2016, Deputy Probation Officer Kyle Dock came across Carlos and talked to him about the path he was on and what his alternatives were. Soon, Carlos was before the court again, looking at another prison term. However, he was granted probation. We placed him in our day reporting center, which is a one-stop shop for evidence-based treatment and services. He recently graduated and spoke at the ceremony. He thanked his current probation officer, Sandra Lopez, and the DRC staff for his help. And he noted how proud he was to have Officer Doc there in attendance. He now works full time, he owns a home, he attends church, and he makes sure his two kids get to school every day. He told us, quote, facing yourself honestly is not easy, but probation made it possible. And I'll never go back to that old life again. That life, those people, it is fake and a lie. What I have now is real. Our community is safer because an opportunity was provided. Another important aspect of the probation department is collaboration with other agencies. We can accomplish more by leveraging all of our community's available resources. We will work closely with social service agencies such as Behavioral Health and Recovery Services, Department of Human Services, Superintendent of Schools, ETR, community-based organizations, and more. A quick example of this is we have four deputy probation officers housed at the Dream Center, which is a multi-agency foster youth program. This is a safe place for foster youth to go and receive services. Foster youth is one of the most vulnerable populations, and we're proud to be a part of that solution. We also work closely with our law enforcement partners. We have officers on task force, such as the Sheriff's CalMet team, and we have an officer at our local DEA office. Uh, we participate in numerous SIT operations, street interdiction teams, and work with regional law enforcement. We want to thank all of our collaborative partners for the help that they give us in accomplishing our mission. Juvenile facilities are a huge part of our department. Incredible work is done there every single day. They house the highest risk youth in our county. Youth with behavioral, substance abuse, mental health, and extreme trauma are everyday issues facing our juvenile correction officers. Yet despite these challenges, they come to work every day ready to keep kids safe and offer them a better alternative. In our juvenile facilities, we try to train our youth to make better decisions with evidence-based training. We also give them tangible skills to assist them upon release such as ASE, automotive certificates, construction classes, and serve safe certificates. Senior Cook Wilson up at Camp Owen trains our kitchen staff. He also provides training and mentoring to our youth. For many years, he's used the, save, the serve safe cur curriculum in order for our youth to get California food handler cards so they can work in the food industry. He meets with youth individually and in group settings to ensure they pass their tests, giving them one more tool to be successful upon release. Lastly, I want to talk about my staff and how they've responded to the county budget situation. As we all know, we've faced uh, general fund reductions and we've seen other revenue streams reduced. My staff have been amazing partners during this difficult process. 
Many steps have been needed, including consolidating units and reorganizing caseloads. This has led to increased workloads. However, they continue to accomplish their mission. We also sought to increase revenue streams. One such example is federal funding for adult Medi-Cal eligible offenders. By focusing on evidence-based assessments, case plans, targeted service referrals, much of our work is reimbursable. Um, this approach is also in line with our philosophy of evidence-based practices. However, it's not easy, and it takes extra work and time in learning new processes. Despite this, staff understood it was vital to secure the resources for positions and to keep our service levels up for the community we serve. Because of their hard work and dedication, the department is scheduled to receive $2.1 million this upcoming fiscal year from this new revenue source. As you move forward with negotiations, I ask that you remember the hard work and sacrifice of these staff to assist the county through troubled economic times while also continuing to provide high level of services to all of our citizens. I hope these stories I've shared give you some insight into the staff of the probation department. However, it's really just the tip of the iceberg of what they do every day. And they do it in very difficult situations and with a very challenging clientele. It is a true honor and privilege to be chief of a department with such professional, dedicated, and passionate staff. So I ask that next week and really throughout the year that when you meet a deputy probation officer or a juvenile correction officer, or a probation program specialist or support staff, that you please thank them for the important and unique role that they play in keeping Kern County safe. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Those are great testimonies, and uh, thank you very, very much to all of the dedicated staff of the probation department. We're grateful for your service and the difference you make in our community. Lastly, this morning, we're going to proclaim July 19, 2018 as American with Disabilities Act Awareness Day in Kirk County, and this proclamation is going to be presented by Supervisor Couch. Motion on the proclamation. Please Second. cast your votes. The motion is approved. Four ayes, one absent. Supervisor Perez. Chairman, members of the board, uh, I'm going to say just a couple of words and turn this over to Jimmy Soto. Uh, there's an event coming up that uh, <clears throat> his organization, which is, uh, I always forget this one, it's IL. Independent Living Center of Kern County. ILCKC. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> On July 26th, we will mark the 28th anniversary of the signing of the American with Disabilities Act which guarantees equal opportunity for, peoples with, for people with disabilities in public accommodations, commercial facilities, employment, transportation, and state and local government. It was signed into law on July 26th by President George H.W. Bush, and it was really one of uh, America's most comprehensive pieces of civil rights legislation that prohibits discrimination and guarantees that people with disabilities have the same opportunities as everyone else to participate uh, in the mainstream of American life. I'll read the proclamation. I'll turn this over, over to uh, Jimmy Soto, and he's going to tell you about a couple of, a, or an, an event that they've got coming up. It reads, the Board of Supervisors County of Kern State of California has officially proclaimed July 19, 2018 as Americans with Disabilities Act Awareness Day in Kern County. Recognition has been uh, entered into the official board minutes signed by our Honorable Chair Mike Maggard, stated today, July 10th. Jimmy, tell us about the events that you've got coming up. Good morning, Mr. Soto. It's good to have you with us. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, um, Supervisor Couch and uh, the other uh, board members. Um, so we celebrate this event every year to bring awareness for people with disabilities about the Americans with Disabilities Act. You know, it's been signed in 1990. It's been 28 years. And this year, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, in the past, we had done stuff to do some media, to bring some awareness, you know, some PR stuff. But this year, we're going to be doing 
some breakout sessions because there's a couple hot uh, topics now that are kind of going around and we feel like this is an opportunity to educate not only people with disabilities but businesses and and other folks about some issues regarding the ADA and one of those has to do with um, service animals and emotional support animals. I know that's been on the news a lot and people get confused about those things. So we're gonna have a breakout session and have some training on that. And then we'll have a second breakout session that has to do with accommodating the deaf with sign language interpreting. So we feel like this is a good opportunity to educate folks and to bring awareness to hopefully bring to make Kern County a better place for all people and people with disabilities. Um, so when the opportunity happens, I like to, to uh, let folks know that one thing that's very unique about the Independent Living Center of Kern County is that over half of the employees, including myself, and half of the board of directors, they all have disabilities. So it's not just book smart, it's, it's uh, life experience of living with a, with a disability. So with that said, I uh, just wanna thank this board for those proclamations and the many proclamations that you folks have given us in the past. And you're all welcome to come. It's July 19th, it's Thursday from 10 to two. Actually, folks in the room, you're welcome to come too uh, to learn more about the Americans with Disabilities Act. And again, thank you for this proclamation. Thank you, Mr. Soto, and thank you for your organization's leadership and for your leadership and for the difference you make in the lives of so many people. Before we begin with public presentations this morning, I'd like to welcome to our microphone CSUB, our new CSUB president, Dr. Lynette Zelezny. We are very pleased to have her with us. This is her first opportunity to address us as the new president of the university. So Dr. Zelezny, please come forward and, uh, and share a few thoughts with us. Welcome. We're very happy to have you in our community. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the board. It's my pleasure to introduce myself, Lynette Zelezny, as the new president of CSUB. I want to share my excitement and the opportunity to work with you as we plan for the future and leverage our assets here in Kern County. I'm very, very pleased to be joining the wonderful team at CSUB and the students that we serve there. And I look forward to hearing about your strategic plans and how I can align the university in an engaged way with the community and with all of the good things that are happening here in Kern County. Thank you for the very warm welcome, and it's a pleasure to be serving in this new role. You're very welcome. We'll look forward to partnering with you. Together we can uh, supply the workforce that we need to grow and expand our economy, so thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we will offer an opportunity for the public to share with us any ideas they have or any thoughts they have about items that are not otherwise on our agenda this morning. We offer two minutes to each participant from the public who would like to do that. Is there anyone this morning who would like to share any thoughts? Chairman Maggard, members of the more, uh, board, good morning. Uh, Brian Marshall, your fire chief. I just wanted to talk about two items. Uh, as we, a few minutes ago, talked about uh, Purple Ribbon Month and the heat, I want to tell you about the events that occurred this weekend because it was a challenge to your Kern County Fire Department and our firefighters. Uh, it was hot temperatures. Uh, the first call was for a structure fire in Arvin, and our fire resources responded there quick, found corrals on fire, uh, nearly 50 animals were killed in that fire. But our firefighters were operating in their personal protective clothing, their self-contained breathing apparatus, and 10 fire units responded to that incident. And uh, they work real hard, and as they're working there, they see another column of smoke in Arvin, and we have a four-unit apartment complex on fire. And they respond to that incident, and it took 16 fire engines and person or fire engines to put that fire out. And again, they're working in their full per personal protective clothing, fighting a structure fire, working real hard. 20 minutes after that fire broke out, the Lebec fire broke out. That was um, in Lebec Oaks. The rapidly uh, spreading vegetation fire was moving uphill. We responded everything that we could. 
Uh, we received assistance from Cal Fire, LA County Fire Department, Ventura County Fire Department. There were multiple air tankers on that fire. There were structures threatened. Again, our firefighters were operating in extreme temperatures, rugged terrain, trying to stop that fire. And they were able to stop it at 62 acres. And we had 47 resources committed to that fire. As that was going, our firefighters in Arvin looked up and saw another column of smoke. A farmhouse was on fire and it was fully involved. Our firefighters left that scene, uh, the apartment complex, went to the farmhouse and engaged that fire. And while we were there, seven firefighters suffered heat-related injuries. Uh, they all received treatment in an emergency department. One of our firefighters is still in the hospital due to his heat-related uh, illness. And if that isn't enough, while our crews were engaged in all of this, there was a semi-truck rollover on the grapevine that required a two-hour extrication. And you can just imagine working on the hot asphalt as you're trying to remove somebody from a crushed semi-truck. And that, that was quite the challenge also. It took 20 resources from the Kern County Fire Department to fight that, or to remove that individual. So it was quite the challenging day. Um, I can tell you, your Kern County firefighters, they worked until they dropped. And, and that Literally. is the honest truth. Like I said, one of our firefighters is still in the hospital today. Um, I, want, I want my firefighters to know that I'm extremely proud of them with the work they did this weekend in extreme temperatures. And I want the public to know that even while all of this was going on, we were still responding to, I guess, the routine emergencies that occur throughout the county. So it was quite the challenging day for your Kern County Fire Department. And again, I'm so proud of the way our firefighters worked that day. The second thing I'd like to talk about is Thyra. Chief, we, Chief yeah. before you do the second thing, just make sure you tell them, please, that we, the Board of Supervisors, are also very proud of them and uh, tell them that we're grateful for their incredible service to our community. Yes, sir. Second thing I'd like to talk about is Thyra, which is the Threat and Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment Program. The County of Kern receives grant funding for Homeland Security grants. That goes to all of the first responder agencies, fire department, law enforcement, public health, so we can better meet the, the threats that occur here in Kern County. As part of a new requirement from FEMA, we have to complete this threat assessment uh, program, and it involves five mission, area, uh, five mission areas, prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. It's the total plan where we evaluate everything that is a threat here in Kern County. Not just the county, but all the special districts, all the cities. We need to look at it from the total approach. So we have a program where we're gonna go out in the community and get community input. On July 19th, right here in this board chambers from six in the evening to 8 p.m., we will be here taking community input on the threats and hazards that we face here in Kern County. We've even created an email address so people can write in and ask questions. That's Thyra, T-H-I-R-A, at kerncountyfire.org. We want our stakeholders involved. Uh, it's very important that we cover this, again, from the total um, Kern County perspective. So we will be in the board chambers, taking that community input, putting together a threat assessment plan for the county so we're better prepared to respond to emergencies, hopefully that do not occur, but we will be prepared. And that's something I take very serious, the, the fire department, uh, the sheriff's department, and um, the Office of Emergency Services. So we'll be working on that, bringing it back to your board in late summer so we can get this plan adopted. And that's also, like I mentioned, a requirement of the FEMA Homeland Security grant funding. So a lot of things going on in the fire department. I just wanna make sure your board and the community is aware 
Uh, I talked about the statistics that from the weekend, so I have some information from your board. So that concludes my public presentation. Chief, hold on just a second. Uh, Supervisor Gleason would like to ask you a question. Chief, good job. Good job to fire department. Could you go over again? You had uh, members of your uh, fire department went to the uh, hospital. Was it one person or was it two? Seven. Supervisor Gleason, seven firefighters received treatment in the emergency department and one was admitted and he's still in the hospital today. And what's his prognosis? Uh, the doctors are still working with him. He related emergencies actually affect the body very seriously and it causes other problems. So uh, it's definitely something we don't take lightly and um, hopefully he has a speedy recovery and can get back to work. But uh, I just want everybody to keep his family, him, at, you know, in thoughts and prayers. Are we looking at the circumstances that caused this problem and seeing if there's some way we could have avoided it or is it just unavoidable? We are doing an after action review of what occurred this okay. weekend to, to make sure that we're doing everything possible. Um, hot day, back to back to back fires, uh, it's stress resources. And unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball to know what's gonna happen next. So I can assure your board, I can assure the public, we're gonna take a look at this. We do not want any of our firefighters ever hurt. Mm -hmm. So we will look at it. Uh, I have staff working on that right now. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, Chief, for the report. Supervisor Couch has a comment as well. Thank you, Chief. I just have two yeah. questions. Um, do you suspect arson in any of those incidents? The fires are all under investigation okay. by the Fire Investigation Division at this time. Okay, and when you say, um, you gave a number and you said like 20 resources. When you say resources, do you mean firefighters? Or is there, is there more to what resources than just people? The resources are the fire apparatus. And to give you an example on the Lebec fire, there were 47 total resources assigned to that, uh, 158 firefighters. The resources is just the equipment. The equipment, Thank yeah. And, and we have 47 fire stations. And of course, the resources include our helicopters, our hand crews, bulldozers, et cetera. But when you look at this in the totality for this afternoon, uh, th that afternoon's events, we were sending resources to all these fires and then backfilling our stations to remain, uh, so they remain covered, and then sending those uh, backfilled resources to other emergencies and dealing with everything else that occurs on just a normal summer day. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Any other members of the public wish to make comment to us this morning? Good morning, Pastor. Could you give us your name for the record? You have two minutes. Uh, yes, Honorable Chairman and the Board. My name is Curtis James Bingham, Sr. Street evangelist for our Lord and Savior, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, who truly is the only begotten Son of our Holy Heavenly Father, God Almighty. And I also like to say the power to this room and for yourself is in God we trust up there. The Lord really appreciates it and respect that you would uh, have such a thing to the public and recognize what real power comes from. I'd also uh, like to say, the Lord don't let you go see your own death, and you don't get to go to your own funeral. And so when I say that, it's really the Lord honoring you now where you can see it and hear it, because the honor and the integrity sits up there and I thank you for allowing me to be before honor right now, and that's you. So it's really the Lord honor you now because you, you don't get to see your own death in front of you. You don't get to hear anything. So that's why that's said. i like to say uh, also, we're in one of the worst times of Kern County, Bakesville. There's 80 murders every three days. I mean, three murders every 80 days. And uh, it's really, really, really a shame to see us be on a pace like this. It's one of the worst times that we have had in uh, Kern County, this murder rate that we're having right now. And so what I'm trying to say is you have people that lie, cheat, steal, use drugs, that's okay. But there should never be one murder throughout the whole United States with another human being getting mad at another and decide they're going to kill them. We're doing so bad on earth and it's right before our face. People don't see it because murder ain't came to your, your place. But there's murders and they just had this... Uh, 
on the news here. Three murders every 80 hours. That's what I meant to say. Every 80 hours, and that's a shame. You know, and so uh, I just wanted to recognize when I say, uh, hey, stealing, lying, cheating, that's there, but it should never be one murder ever. And so I'd also like to take this time to say, when I go to the gas station, they raise the gas up, and sometimes we got to pay $20 extra for gas, and we don't get a choice in the same. And we all know that we just pay it. So going up this, this, this penny is such a wonderful, beautiful thing to give the people an opportunity to have a choice. It's one of the wisest, greatest decisions I've ever heard our sheriff come up with for this penny. I think people will be so glad and happy to receive something. If I paid... $20 less for my gas, I'll receive the same benefit if I paid $40 more. But this penny will save maybe your kid, maybe keep your car from being stolen, your house being broken in. You know, it'd save banks from being robbed. Pastor, you know? your, your two minutes has expired, Pastor. Oh, I did not see a clock. Yeah, it, they didn't put it up for some reason. I'm sorry for oh, that. Oh, well, okay. Well, I'm just trying to just say that what he's done is a very wise thing, and I think we should uh, let him uh, have it. Thank May you, I Pastor. address your death of your friend? Yes. Your friend? I would say this. Lonnie Shelton, our mayor just passed away, and our ex-sheriff. If I did like this, and God called me home, my arms would stop. Mm. The spirit would come out of me. To be absent from the body means to be pleasant with the Lord. So according to their faith and belief in Christ, your good friend is alive and living better than us in the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So Thank I just would like to bless you with that. And uh, thank you for allowing me to come up. And also, it's all about money. There's groups out there that got $50 billion, and the sheriff and them can't touch that, but yet and still they're out there trying to fight for us. Winning for us, but it's a losing battle. Thank you, but, Pastor. Uh, we thank you. Thank you. Pray thank God you for you. your prayers. Okay. Does anybody else like to speak this morning? Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. You have two minutes. Okay. Please give us your name. Bruce Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R, and I'm in the 3rd District. And I'm sorry to have to appear before you again today, but uh, let's see if I can get through this a little bit here. This is regarding the Karen County in lieu of OHV fund and the Parks Commission. Um, unfortunately, you're not having a meeting next Tuesday, and the following Tuesday I cannot be here. And the commission meeting is the day after that on the 25th. I cannot be there either. It's, uh, so I am doing this today. Um, last time I appeared before you a couple of weeks ago, I showed you a grant agreement with the stewards of Sequoia, which you approved, which has a clause in it that says created to accomplish projects to designated off-road vehicle areas. I went back and pulled the documents from 2014. There were four grant requests, one of which was the Sheriff's Department, and by the way, they were all processed the same day, came to the, you folks the same day in the same session, and thank you for encouraging that in the future. Um, this is the um, Kern River Parkway Foundation, Shell Park Fence Project, same clause. Excuse me. This is the um, Friends of Jawbone, same clause. This is the Stewards of the Sequoia, 2014, same clause. This is the Sheriff's Department. In that case, it's a MOU, same clause. So I think it's safe without taxing staff to, for every grant request in the last five years that we can assume it's standard language was in 2014 is this year. The, I think it's wholly inappropriate, under that agreement, the Parks Department's grant request for the OHV does not meet, on a technical, for technical reasons, does not meet the requirement. They may choose to change that down the road at some point, but mid-grant cycle, when you've already let grants out, it's inappropriate to remove conditions from this parks application grant agreement that you've already let out and put on other grant applicants. Mr. Miller, I'm sorry that your two minutes has expired, so can you please wrap your, your comments up? Sure, I would encourage, there are some other reasons for the grants the, that this is technically a problem. I'll just real quickly say there's one paragraph in here that relates to OHV 
and it concludes by saying, there's actually two, I guess, concludes by saying, due to the direct enforcement action, rangers were able to catch the violators, cite them, and have county staff repair the dugout area and return to its original form. So evidently, they are able to. Thank you, Mr. Miller, for your comments this morning. Okay, I would encourage the supervisors to perhaps, con if they are so motivated, um, McLeason's representative was at the last meeting, but perhaps proactively uh, let their views be known to their to Thank you, Mr. Miller. Time has expired. Thank you. Would there be anybody else who'd like to speak to us this morning? Is the clock working now, Madam Clerk? Okay. Now oh. it's working, right? Oh. It's not, not yeah. working quite yet, but I'll, I'll let... Okay. Oh, you think it is working? Go ahead. Please give <coughs> Good us your morning. name, Good morning. My name is David Abbasi. I'm with the Central Valley Cannabis Association, and I'm here on behalf of the Green Cross Collective Corporations. Mr. Gleason, you had complained about a lack of trust and, and some fraud regarding the cannabis community. And, well, I'm here to say that there are organizations uh, that are honest, that are concerned about the fraud and the trust uh, in, in with regards to the public corruption and the public confession recently by Supervisor Perez, where she admitted that special interests have influenced this board. This body has been influenced by special interests. And she made that during public comments. And she also abstained from voting on any future cannabis votes and asked that Chairman Maggard do the same. So we have some concerns ourselves, and we are an honest group. We've provided input, but it's fallen on deaf ears. We have a petition circulating. It's the third one, because the other two are monopolies in grandiose fashion. We are ensuring that this is a fair and inclusive process. The legitimate operators who have proof should be able to get state licensing, uh, and they should not have to pay to play. Mr. Maggard, you seem to not care who operates these places, uh, but you do. Uh, you wanted seven, and we know which seven. Accusations are ridiculous, but they continue to serve your donors. Uh, we're not fools. You're not fooling Mr. Alsop over here. You're not fooling the public. We hear you, and we hear what you're saying, but we know the, the truth. And by our expressions and comments, you can tell we're not buying it. Um, we're not fools. What we have here is uh, evidence that a crop uh, dispensary had given in September, September 8th. And then in September 28th, they were not on that list. Green Cross was. In December, we were taken off that list. The crop was then put on the list in January after they gave you a contribution, Mr. Maggard. And so I've tried to get in touch with your planning department, but they're not responding. We've already provided proof. Mr. Bossi, your time has expired. And for you to take dispensaries off and go on the radio and talk about them, a fraud myself by name, and lump me up with Mr. Bossi, your time has expired. Perez. Please make your take your comments to a close. It's clear you were just getting rid of the competition for your donors, and now you've taken us off the list and put them on. Please correct that. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to make comment to us this morning about matters not otherwise on our agenda? Okay, we're going to close public comment, return to the board. Any members of the board wish to make a report? Supervisor Gleason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to have a referral to direct the CAO's office to coordinate uh, with uh, Jose Gonzalez, our home, County Homeless Initiative Coordinator, and other de county departments and stakeholders in the community to call for a special meeting of the Board of Supervisors to be held Monday, August 13th at 10 a.m. regarding homelessness. Madam Clerk, I'm sorry you interrupted there. Did you catch that? He is making a request that we have a special meeting of the Board of Supervisors on Monday, August 13th at 10 a.m., was it? To discuss the matter of homelessness. Does that um, fit into our calendar appropriately? Yes, Chairman, it does. We can, we can agendize that meeting. And um, Mr. Uh, Gonzalez, our homeless chief, uh, unofficial title, are you uh, able to meet with us on that, at that time? Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, so does that require a vote or is that, uh, can staff just accommodate that? Colleagues, are you okay with proceeding with that, having a special meeting at that time? Okay, very good, thank you, Supervisor Gleason. Any other members of the board wish to make comment? Supervisor Couch? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a referral to staff to provide us a report, to provide a report to the board on the November water bond. I believe it is titled, The Water Supply and Water Quality Act of 2018. The bond may be of uh, benefit to Kern County in our efforts to comply with Sigma. 
And I would like you, if you would reach out, and I can provide this the contact information for this gentleman. His name is Dominic Figueroa, and he's with the water he's with the water bond campaign. I don't want this to be obviously a campaign um, stop for him, but just providing us information that would allow us to think about whether or not we want to take a position on that, and providing information to the public is what I would be after. So I'll give you his uh, his contact information at that point. Do you need a motion to that effect? I don't, and okay. we'll, we'll, do, we'll do that. Thank you Let's very see. much. So can staff be prepared if, if uh, Supervisor Couch referenced somebody who I think you said was a proponent of the? He's a, yeah, he's working with the, uh, the campaign. Okay, so could uh, Mr. Uh, Figueroa. Mr. Figueroa is his name. Mr. Alsop, could you make sure that we hear uh, kind of the full context of what the issue is about that day? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for those referrals, colleagues. Are there any other members of the board that would like to make comment to us this morning? Okay, let's go on then. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, on page five of the agenda. It's item number 31, and it is a status report. It's update number two on the operational administrative analysis of the Kern County Fire Department presented by our Chief Brian Marshall. Good morning, Chief. Good morning, Chairman Maggard and members of the board. This is the second update to the operational and administrative analysis of the Kern County Fire Department. Um, I promised your board we'd come back on a monthly basis. Um, on June 26, uh, 2018, I came before your board with the first update and talked about the 62 recommendations in the analysis, and I discussed five priority recommendations. As we discuss this, uh, your board directed the fire department to develop uh, the following matrix, if you will. What the current recommendations we're working on, uh, the financial costs associated with each recommendation, the progress that the fire department's making on the recommendations, and a timeline for uh, completion. Additionally, your board asked for what the next projects the fire department would be working on through the analysis. So again, to go through the, the five, so I can bring you up to date where we are, uh, the first uh, recommendation, recommendation number nine, is 100% cost recovery for our hazardous materials program and seeking financial support from those companies in Kern County that store, transport, or incorporate hazardous uh, substances within their operation. So with recommendation number nine, it's unknown at this time what the revenue would be associated with this. Our progress is we're working with public health services through the Certified Unified Program Agencies, which is the COOPA program that manages hazardous materials uh, through the county and how we would have the possibility of uh, public health, environmental health billing for that services for fire department uh, fees. We're reviewing costs associated with our hazardous materials response program, personnel cost, uh, equipment cost, apparatus cost, to put all of this together. So we've started it. I believe we'll be back in front of your board uh, by uh, October 31st with uh, a, a recommendation on how we can move forward with this and uh, bring in the revenue to the fire department. The next recommendation, number 16, was regarding the aircraft rescue and firefighting services that the fire department provides to Meadows Field Airport and Inuit Kern Airport. So the revenue estimates for these two, uh, the fire department spends approximately $1.5 million annually um, to staff the Meadows Field uh, Airport Fire Station. And in your current airport, uh, which I'm proud to say that at eight o'clock this morning, the Kern County Fire Department ceased operations for the R services at Inyo Kern Airport. And uh, Inyo Kern Airport District, Indian Wells Valley Airport District has taken over the services of uh, the ARF for that airport as of eight o'clock this morning. Um, on this afternoon's agenda, your board will approve a lease agreement for the fire station at Inyo Kern Airport. It's something that we've worked out. That fire station was built with FAA funding, 
and we will lease the fire station for 25 years from the district. Uh, again, that's $466,000 in savings right now. Uh, we're going to have to work with the county administrative office and Meadowsfield executive staff to develop a program on how we could achieve um, some sort of program where Meadowsfield paid for our services. I know the airport is going through some uh, several big projects, so we'll be working uh, with uh, the CAO's office in Meadowsfield and bring that back. So the time frame, Meadowsfield, we started it. I don't know when we'll be able to get that one done. A lot will depend on the financial resources available from Meadowsfield. In your current airport, uh, we actually sent the termination letter in March, and I'm happy again to say it's done today. Recommendation 34, strategic business plan for the fire department. Um, something uh, I'm really excited about. As we discussed this, um, we included $20,000 in our budget uh, to do this, to hire a consultant, and there was uh, some discussion by uh, Supervisor Maggard, Chairman Maggard about this, uh, took it back, we've looked at it. We can do this. I have the talent in my fire department and I know we can work with the CAO's office to develop a, an in-house strategic plan which would provide a three to five year plan for the fire department going forward. Uh, like I said, we can do it. We have the talent. We've done some research already. So we've begun this. I believe by the time we get all the community input, put it all together, we can finish it up by the end of the year. And then I think that will be a good uh, starting point as the CAO's office develops the recommended budget for the next fiscal year. Recommendation 52, um, this is the implementation of an in-service fire uh, company inspection fee. The revenue associated with this is $720,000 annually. Uh, we're working on developing a new ordinance and fee structure to incorporate this into the, the fire prevention fee ordinance. Um, we uh, will bring this back and have it implemented by uh, hopefully October 31st of this year. Uh, we'll do community meetings, make sure everybody understands what the, this new fee ordinance would be. Recommendation 53 ties into uh, the, the last recommendation, and that's the utilization of civilian fire inspectors and plans reviewers in our fire prevention. Uh, division. We've begun that process. Um, in some discussions with uh, the CAO's office, uh, there may be some different organizations, uh, organizational charts that we didn't look at. So we're going back, reviewing that. Uh, again, fire prevention is one of the number one things that we do. Uh, it's a lot cheaper to prevent the fire than it is to go fight the fire. So we're working on that. Um, if we do hiring or create any new job uh, specifications, uh, going through that process, but we believe we can fully implement this uh, by the end of the year. Uh, again, the, the county, the fire department, and the firefighters union are in negotiations. There are several recommendations in the analysis that speak to the MOU, and we're in negotiations. Uh, don't really know when those will be completed. One additional item that's not listed in the 62 recommendations is in section nine, there's consideration for cost reductions and improving uh, solvency. Um, and item number 10 was discussing a fire impact fee. I've had some discussions with the CAO's office. Um, and I think uh, we need to uh, do some further analysis. There could be some additional fee structures or organizations that um, could promote efficiencies within the fire department. Maybe that's developer impact fees or actually the formation of a fire district. And I think that what we're gonna do is work with the auditor's office, the CAO's office, uh, 
my executive staff and, and really take a financial look at that and see if it does uh, benefit the fire department. And we'll be back before your board uh, in September to discuss that, uh, what some of the options could be. And I don't want to steal the, the sheriff's thunder. I know he's going to present a sales tax. That could also uh, work into uh, this fire impact fee. Tracking spreadsheet. Uh, we want to keep track. And we want to keep on task with all of our uh, 62 recommendations. So we've developed a, a tracking worksheet. You have that in front of you. Uh, basically, we're looking at who the recommendations are referred to, who's going to be involved in this, the actual recommendation, where we are with the status of each recommendation, uh, some of the notes associated, so your board has uh, complete transparency on what we're doing. The physical, the physical impact of each of these recommendations, when we've started them, the completion date, and also we've put in there uh, when we brought this before your board. So we're working on that, filling in the blanks as we speak. So again, we stay on task and we stay uh, transparent. Your board asked for the next items. Um, in light of uh, some of the things that's happened over the last weekend, firefighter safety is very important, so we've kind of addressed some of those. But recommendation number five is a, an internet-based video conferencing system. Kern County's over 8,000 square miles. For us to drive a fire truck from Ridgecrest to our training center, that's a lot of money and it's a lot of man hours. So we're going to look at that. There's been suggestions that we uh, take a look at maybe some APCD grant funding. So we'll be actively pursuing that. Recommendation number eight is the incorporation of regional centers to deliver our supplies to our fire stations. Uh, I've directed some of my staff to look at a Lean Six process on how we could use, say, UPS or FedEx to deliver supplies to our outlying stations and the efficiencies there. So we're starting on that. Recommendation number 12, uh, and that's an accounting for all of our wildland program and the cost associated with that. Uh, we've already begun that. We have a pretty in-depth spreadsheet right now, so we're going to just finish that up, and I believe we can cross this recommendation off the list. <coughs> Excuse me. Recommendation number 20 is the installation of automatic fire alarm systems uh, in our fire stations. We're getting some prices on that. Um, we want to make sure our firefighters are safe in the fire station, so having updated uh, fire alarm systems. So we'll be bringing that one back. Recommendation number 21 is uh, putting uh, automatic fire sprinkler systems. We already have some quotes on that, so we're finishing that one up, and I believe we'll be able to cross that one off the list right away. Recommendation 22 is vehicle exhaust systems in our fire stations. Uh, a lot of studies on firefighter cancer and the diesel exhaust that gets in the fire station from the fire apparatus. Staff's working on that, um, getting that all up to speed so we can make sure our firefighters are safe. So that concludes my second update. Uh, again, we're on this. We're working real hard as we continue to respond to emergencies, but I believe we're in a pretty good place now with your direction from the last board meeting, and we're going to continue uh, 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 tackling this and uh, get through all 62 recommendations. So that concludes my report, and I have staff available to answer any questions your board may have. Thank you, Chief. Do any members of the board have a question or comment before we go to the public to see if they have any questions? I don't see any. So uh, members of the public, do you wish to make comment about anything the Chief has reported to us this morning? Okay, I'll return to the board then. Colleagues, what's your pleasure? Supervisor Couch. Thank you. Um, just a suggestion on, I guess it's 16A, which is 
the ARF services being paid for at Meadows Field. Um, this may be your intention anyway. It sounded like your intention was to find the million five hundred and two thousand from Meadows Field to reimburse um, you for that. That's what it costs to provide the service. If you can find less than that, I say we take it anyway. Take it maybe the wrong phrase, but um, don't stop. Um, just because we can't get to a million five, if you can get to eight hundred thousand, that would be a nice um, effort as well. So I don't know how the rest of the board feels about that, but whatever you can accomplish as a reimbursement, I think is worthwhile. Supervisor Couch, through the chair, we'll be working with the CAO's office and, and Middlesfield staff to uh, work through this, and we'll keep reporting to your board uh, the status update. Thank you, I agree. Uh, Supervisor Couch, we should uh, take whatever, we should receive whatever uh, reimbursement is possible at the beginning, but work our way towards full reimbursement eventually, if not immediately. Supervisor Gleason. Thanks, Chairman. Thanks, Thanks Chairman. Chief, good job. Appreciate it. A big step forward, I appreciate it. It's, uh, uh, let me see, let me tell you what I'm reading your matrix and as someone, your supervisor, what I'm looking at. I'm saying, okay, we got some negotiation going on with the union, they're gonna produce some type of response and you'll be able to fill those in at a time and date and an amount that you do not control. And that's gonna be something that happens through negotiations. You're, uh, pr you're in work now talking about a $1.5 million revenue from Meadows Field. That sounds good. I like what Supervisor Couch said. Uh, I'm glad that's in there. You don't know when that's gonna be conclude, completed. I don't think that's gonna, shouldn't be too long. Are there factors to, to delay that, should that be, you know, is it, is it the, the, the delays the airport or the delays you, or what's going on with that timeline, the unknown on that? Supervisor Gleason, through the chair, we're ready to act, uh, but a lot will depend on the financings available from uh, Meadows Field. So again, we'll be working with the CAO's office, Meadows Field, and hopefully we have a little bit better idea uh, with budget being locked up or, or almost finalized, I think we'll have a little bit better idea, but it's totally outside the hands of the fire department. Okay, so I appreciate that. So what I would like to do is set up a meeting with the airport director. So if just remember note, I'll call her up and make sure that we're aware I wanna to talk to her and make sure we know where we are and that we are coordinating and working together on that. The 466,000 that's cash in the bank, that's red. Why is that red? Is it because it's a good thing or? Because it's done. It's done, okay, red's done, that's good. So I'm seeing uh, negotiations, I'm seeing 1.5 possible revenue, I'm seeing that we don't know about, but it may be, I'm seeing a savings of 466,000, a bunch of other unknowns, and you're gonna assess somebody a fee of $720,000 sometime in the next year, and you're developing an ordinance to do that. That's correct, Supervisor Gleason. That's the big picture of what I'm seeing out of, out of this whole thing. Is that what you want me to take? Is there anything I'm missing? This is, this is really the start of it. Uh, we've been working on a lot of items. Um, we put this together based on your uh, board's direction two weeks ago, and we'll be coming back every month, and we'll be filling in hopefully more red. Good. Um, okay, that's all I want. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you very much. It's clear to me, but uh, still got a long way to go on this thing. Appreciate it. Any other members of the board wish to make comment this morning? Chief, we thank you for your report. Uh, grateful for your progress. Look forward to much more of the same um, and uh, appreciate the, the, your leadership in the department to accomplish that. Uh, is there a motion to receive and file? So moved. Second. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved. Four ayes, one absent. Supervisor Perez. Thank you. Next is item number 42 on page six of our agenda this morning, and that is uh, a request from the Kern County Sheriff's Office. Um, to place a general purpose 1% uh, transaction and use tax uh, on our ballot on November the 6th. Good morning, Madam Clerk. The Sheriff's Department is trying to hand you a little bit of information. Good morning, Sheriff. Good morning. Nice to have you with us. Am I on? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to address this board on uh, this, this issue. Uh, I'm bringing forward a request for this board to place on the November ballot a one cent sales tax 
uh, general sales tax that um, I think the CAO, CAO can probably better articulate the amount of money and, and how that would work. Uh, specifically today, uh, this is a proposed request from us for a placement of a local one cent transaction use tax measure on the November 6th general election ballot. Today we would ask this board to authorize County Council to draft the proposed sample ballot language, ordinance, and resolution, and any other necessary documents for presentation to your board for your consideration at the Board of Supervisors meeting scheduled for July 24th. The specific reasons for this request and how we got here, uh, currently in the Metropolitan Patrol um, Division, we have 24 vacant deputy sheriff positions. Uh, throughout this, some of these positions are TDY, some are in, in field training, some are in the academy. The Delano substation has three vacancies. Kern Valley, one vacancy. Lamont substation, three vacancies. Mojave, three vacancies. North Area substations, two vacancies. Roseman substation, well, one vacancy. Taft substation, three vacancies. Tatchby, two. Wasco City substation has two vacancies, however, they're being backfilled uh, per uh, contract. Just yesterday, I received a phone call or an email requesting uh, school resource officers in our county high schools. Uh, they made a request for uh, school resource officers and they would pay for them. I don't have a body or bodies to place in those positions, even though they have the money. In fiscal year 1718, we have lost a total of 52 deputy sheriffs, 12 to retirement, one dismissal, and 39 took other job opportunities. From 2013 to today, we've lost a total of 229 deputy sheriffs, 73 to retirement, 12 dismissals, and 144 deputy sheriffs took other job opportunities. During that period, we have not received one a tr lateral transfer into our organization. Currently, the Bakersfield Police Department has 30 lateral police officer applications. 25 of those are from deputy sheriffs. During the last five years, we have hired and trained a total 172 deputy sheriff trainees in our basic academy, and of those, uh, approximately 40 have left uh, our agency. An example of the 2013-12 basic post academy started with 22 SO hires and 33 BPD hires. The academy graduated 20 SO hires and 26 BPD hires. Seven of the 20 KCSO hires are still employed. 10 are currently employed by the Bexville Police Department. At full staffing, we have 607 deputy sheriff positions at all ranks. We are currently funded for 550. During fiscal year 13-14 year and 14-15, the Sheriff's office, office average attrition rate was approximately 33 deputy sheriffs per year. In 15-16, the attrition rate dramatically increased to 54 deputy sheriffs. In 16-17, it again increased to 64 deputy sheriffs. The attrition rate in 17-18 is 52 deputy sheriffs. We evaluated how long it takes to complete the county hiring and training programs. Utilizing the Sheriff's Office experience with this process, we estimate it takes approximately 16 months to complete the recruitment, hiring, and training process needed to develop a deputy sheriff capable to work in a patrol assignment. The following is a breakdown of the 16-month recruitment, testing, hiring, and training process. The Kern County Human Resources Department projects the recruitment and testing process takes approximately 11 weeks. Kern County Sheriff's Office background investigation estimates it takes 14 weeks. California minimum training requirements, Peace Officers Standard and Training Basic Academy is currently 960 hours and is completed in 24 weeks. Upon completion of that academy, all deputy sheriffs are required by state regulations to attend a 60 hour Standards and Training for Corrections Supplemental Core Academy. The STC Supplemental Core Academy is completed in six days with two additional 10-hour days to cover policies and procedures. All deputies are also given a 40-hour training course on crisis intervention to help deal with our mentally ill population. 
The state mandated field training program takes a minimum of 14 weeks to complete. It's not uncommon for a trainee to be extended in that program. The post basic academy is both academically and physically demanding. The Sheriff's Office Basic Academy has historically met the state average with an approximate 66% graduation success rate. Current HR received 898 applications for the upcoming January 2019 Post Academy. Of those 898, 770 were invited to take the written exam. Only 349 scheduled for the uh, showed up for the scheduled written exam. Following the written exam, physical agility exam, and oral examination, only 97 candidates made the eligible list. Only 51 of the 97 submitted their personal history uh, statements to backgrounds. The Sheriff's Office can expect to graduate 11 deputy sheriffs on the following projections. 51 currently in backgrounds. Average pass rate. Uh, uh, three, in the last three fiscal years, 33%. Expected number of deputies to start the academy is 17. The historical academy pass rate of 66% leaves us with 11 deputy sheriff that will graduate out of those 1,000 applicants. The uh, Ridgecrest Jail, we're working to reopen the Ridgecrest Jail and to staff with regular deputy sheriffs so that when that jail is empty, we will have additional staff in the East Kern to handle calls for service. The Ridgecrest Chief of Police has partnered with us and promised to keep his two transportation officers uh, when, if and when we open that new jail so that they can transport inmates to Bakersfield and or to the Mojave Jail. We're suffering from the same uh, situation in our detention facilities. In fiscal year 1516 through 1718, we averaged 27.6 detention deputies per year leaving the department due to retirement dismissal, and other career opportunities. Fortunately, there are several colleges providing STC training for which the Sheriff's Office is trying to hire academy graduates. We are experiencing similar issues with dispatchers and other civilian employees. In 15, 16, 17, 18, we lost 21 dispatchers. Dispatchers are extremely difficult to hire and to train. We have been great partners through this process of the fiscal emergency that this county is in. We're in year three of a four-year plan. There's no guarantee after year four we will be out of this fiscal emergency. We certainly know that we will not be back to the normal. During this process, we have done uh, a lot of things to try and minimize the impact on the county. We've been great partners by cutting our gang unit, by cutting our air unit, and by cutting narcotics units. We're at a point now where when a deputy sheriff from one of the substations or local patrol picks another agency to work for, we have no one to backfill that particular position. I don't bring this forward lightly. I'm, I'm not a person that believes in raising taxes, but I believe that we're at a position in this county where we have no, I as the sheriff have no other alternative but to ask the taxpayers to come forward and help bail this county out of this fiscal emergency. It's important to note that this uh, tax is not specifically for public safety. However, uh, of course, the sheriff will come forward and ask for a lot of, of this money if it's passed. Uh, it's also for uh, other agencies such as fire, uh, park rangers, uh, libraries, uh, you name it. This board has a purview to spend this money or to allocate this money how they see uh, fit. I think it's extremely important that you understand we must give deputy sheriffs a substantial pay raise. If we don't do that first, everything that we do will be, will be back here next year asking for the same type of thing. Uh, I, I think it's extremely important that we look at both aspects for retention and recruitment, uh, not just uh, hiring more deputies, we've already started doing that, but also getting them up to uh, a pay that is uh, at least comparable with our counterparts at the Bakersfield Police Department. Uh, with that, I have Commander Doug Yacht from Personnel, and I have uh, Chief Deputy Shelley Castaneda, and we will answer any of the, your questions that you might have, and I would invite the CAO to, to give his input on what the one cent sales tax would do for the county. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, any comments by the CAO's office before we come to the board and then go to the public? Not, or you want to wait and do it later? Okay, very good. Colleagues, do you have any comments before we uh, go to the public and see if they have any comments? 
Thank you, Sheriff, for your presentation. I'm sure we're going to have some questions for you and want to dialogue with you in a moment. But we thought we would first offer an opportunity to, for the public to come forward and share your thoughts with us about the, the, uh, this question posed to us by the Sheriff. Are any members of the public wanting to make comment to us this morning? Good morning. Could you please give us your name and proceed? <clears throat> Yes, good morning, Honorable Board. My name is Kevin Wright, and I'm the president of the Kern County Sheriff's Command Association, and we represent all the management within the Sheriff's Department from the rank of lieutenant all the way to chief. And I'm here this morning just to support the Sheriff and what the Sheriff has to say. We're the ones that have been tasked with trying to manage the budget and our resources, and the time has come to try to do something different. Uh, the department's doing what they can, the county's doing what they can, and this may be the time that we actually need to go to the public and ask for some help and see if they're willing to, uh, to step forward and help us at this time. So I just uh, support what the sheriff says and hope that the board will also support the sheriff. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Good morning, Mr. Aguirre. Do you need, a, do you, would you like to use an interpreter this morning? Uh, no, thank you so much. Very good, thank you. Could you please give us your name for the record? Gustavo Aguirre, G-U-S-T-A-V-O, Aguirre, A-G-U-I-R-R-E. Um, I think uh, if I understood correctly, uh, you, your board asked the fire department to do a, uh, I think, very comprehensive analysis of uh, their operations and, and they came up with uh, different uh, ideas on how to improve you know, uh, everything. Uh, I think uh, that needs to be done also with the sheriff department. Uh, yes, money is, is uh, part of that, but uh, the other piece, what's the morale in that department? At one point I changed jobs and I got a 20% cut in my salary because I didn't like the, the environment in that, uh, with that uh, employer. So I think uh, one option is doing that, you know, evaluating the, 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 uh, that department. Also, uh, as you know, uh, the com communities we work with uh, came up with, uh, you know, what's the vision for communities about the budget? And uh, the formula that you have right now is, uh, you know, most of uh, uh, the general fund goes to safety and most of that goes to sheriff. Uh, and uh, the request from communities about budget is being the, to, that is safety is not only coming in the form of sheriff, but also investing in the communities, making the community safer, parks, streets, lights, everything. So um, that's the concern that I will have. I think personally, I will not have any problem with paying more taxes as long as it goes to prevention of, uh, you know, uh, uh, improving the safety, not only sheriffs. I, I understand, you know, that sheriffs deserve their, you know, fair pay. Uh, I support that, but it needs to be balanced with everything else, you know. Uh, and also, uh, statewide, there is a, the, uh, the gas tax that is, it may be repealed. Uh, and our meetings with uh, all the departments, uh, county departments, they express that uh, the county is, uh, I think the first time is getting some good uh, funds for different projects like streets, you know, fixing streets, which is one of the focus area for uh, the residents we work with. So I think I will encourage the, the board to uh, somehow, you know, at the capacity that you may have to support, you know, keeping those, those taxes because those go directly to com community investments. So I think my main concern is, uh, you know, two recommendations, do an evaluation on the sheriff and the concern that the, the platform of the budget uh, from the community point of view is more prevention, more community investment. So please consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aguirre. Good morning. Good morning. Could you share your name with us before you proceed, please? Uh, David Nelson, NELSON. I'm here as a uh, representative of Derek Robinson, the Kern County Firefighters uh, local president. More importantly, though, I'm here on behalf of 500 members of the Kern County Firefighters to show our support for Sheriff Youngblood's 
uh, proposal of the one cent sales tax increase and to encourage your board to allow the sheriff to proceed with this proposed ballot measure for the unincorporated areas of the county. As many of you know, our Kern County sheriffs as well as our firefighters are suffering from many of the same challenges, underfunding and understaffing. The, this ultimately leads to our communities being underserved, working side by side with our sheriffs, we all feel the impact of the current situation. Fire engines sitting on a street corner waiting for an officer to clear scene in violent situations and sheriff's officers having to sit on that same street corner waiting for a fire engine in the medical situations that they encounter. It's uncomfortable for both, uh, both aspects. Each agency has seen an unprecedented increase in requests for service over the last several years. In fact, two days ago, as Chief Marshall said this morning, Kern County firefighters experienced what is becoming an all too commonplace incident. Several large incidents taking place in a short period of time within just a few hours. Wildland fire in the same area as the multiple structure fires that he spoke of, temperatures in the area of 106 degrees, many of the same members of the departments responding to multiple incidents back to back, ultimately leading to seven members of our department being hospitalized, one of which, as you've heard, will be uh, released today. Uh, many more, however, were part of a rehab process that took place in-house that uh, was above and beyond what our normal considerations are. Things are different, they're changing, incidents are becoming more complex and more frequent. An increase in revenues would allow your board to allocate the proper funding of both agencies, further improving the level of service that is provided to the community. The Kern County firefighters support this sales tax measure and we're asking you to put it on the ballot and let the people of Kern County decide. Thank you for your time and consideration in this matter. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Good morning. Good morning, Honorable Chairman, members of the board, Romeo Agbalog, on behalf of Current Citizens for Sustainable Government. Um, here before you this morning to ask your board to consider just a few things. First, uh, issue of transparency, timing, and process. Um, well, we certainly understand the county's position financially. We'd like you to uh, consider the city of Bakersfield and the steps that it took to place a one cent sales tax measure on the November ballot. The city of Bakersfield hired a polling firm to conduct research on the viability of a tax. The city of Bakersfield spent a considerable amount of time meeting with interested stakeholders throughout the community to gather feedback. The city of Bakersfield held a series of public meetings and public hearings to further gather input from the community as to the viability of a sales tax and ultimately decided to place the tax on the ballot. Also, in comparison, this board placed a library tax on the ballot a few years ago and went through a very similar process. Um, I understand the county's economic situation, but I'm wondering whether or not uh, the timing um, and giving the public an opportunity to weigh in. As you know, the county of Kern is very large. It's not contained like the city of Bakersfield. We have West Kern, East Kern, Kern River Valley, and areas beyond, who I'm sure would love an opportunity to weigh in on this matter as well. So I'd just like to leave those things um, at the table for you to consider as you look uh, towards moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Michael Chern of Cedar representing Kern Tax. Uh, we've been following your metamorphosis for the last three or four years to address the financial condition of the county. And I wanna say to the sheriff, I think he's been a team player. He's worked with the CAO's office and, you super, and the supervisors to ad address everything he could to be part of the solution. Um, we have a problem. There's been a management audit with several constructive cost measures that was released over six months ago, which the whole program should have been implemented already. You need to implement every cost saving, every best practice, and to show the public that you've done everything possible. And as far as being a general tax, and basically it's the needs of public safety, 
um, we're concerned that this really won't be a general tax. And that aspect will have to be discussed. But more importantly, we think, is the open and transparent issues that the major structural deficit of the fire department so far seems to be addressed in the last two reports we have by increasing fees. Well, fire and public safety are property services. We pay property taxes. So now we're gonna hear of a new round of fees going back to the property tax owners with no clear cut plan from the fire department to address the problems outlined in the report that you paid $150,000 for. Uh, our board meeting will, we will have a current tax board meeting next week and we'll be for, thoroughly discussing this, but we think it's imperative that the public knows that the issues outlined in that uh, comprehensive management report have been issued and addressed. And the fire department and the sheriff department are as lean as totally possible. The, the city came up and we've had a long discussion with them and they've, they're in a structural problem too based on sales tax revenues, the internet and everything. That's a whole other issue. But we had several discussions with council members saying, oh, we are so efficient. Oh, we are so well managed just because they cut and they say we're cheap. Cheap and cutting budgets does not make you efficient. Efficiency is how well you deliver the product out the back end. And there are needs to be addressed and we'd like to see what, a plan to address those services and how the money's gonna be well spent. And if it's truly only gonna go to public safety, that's another issue. If you're gonna bring this plan forward, What's going to go to parks? What's going to go to poverty? What's going to go to homelessness? What's going to go to quality of life? We've had those negotiations with the city and they are willing going forward to work with us on our recommendations and negotiations uh, with it passes. So with that said, thank you very much for your time and I'll report back to you in two weeks what our decision is on this when you have your presentation again. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to share their thoughts with us this morning about the sheriff's recommendation? Okay, I'm gonna close the public portion and return to the board. Colleagues? Mr. Chairman, could I? Could yes, I sir. Say, Mr. Uh, Sheriff. First of all, it's important that the public understand that uh, the time frame that we have to work with. Uh, if Mr. Trump he has some, some great ideas, we just don't have the time uh, to accomplish a lot of those things. This is not a stacking tax. In other words, the city of Bakersfield has a one cent sales tax that's going to be on the ballot. If the county chooses to put one on, it would be for county residents only. It would not increase the city's tax. So it would be then countywide, like Wasco, um, Delano, um, uh, Ridgecrest. They already have that one cent sales tax and they're at eight, eight and a quarter. And, and secondly, and most importantly to me, if the city has this sales tax on the ballot, and they do, and it passes, and we're not on the ballot, the city's going to hire 50 to 60 new police officers with that money. Where do you think they're going to get them from? They're going to get them from the sheriff's office. We won't be able to replace them. This, I, I promise you, will require a closure of substations and a closure of a lot of units within the sheriff's office because we won't have the bodies to fill those positions. So uh, I, I understand uh, where Mr. Turnips is coming from, uh, but we're, this is a, a, a need that has to be addressed now or we're gonna, we're gonna be several years in rebuilding and recovering. Thank you, Sheriff. <clears throat> okay, colleagues, what are your thoughts? CEO, would you like to? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Chairman, maybe I can provide some um, sort of nuts and bolts background on um, the sheriff's proposal or, or based on his board letter and his proposal today. The uh, a one penny 
um, increase in the sales tax. Uh, that'd be one penny on every dollar spent in unincorporated areas, 10 cents on every $10 and so forth, uh, would generate approximately $35 million annually. Uh, that would be for uh, general purposes in the county, of which uh, are uh, uh, within the general fund uh, vital services such as public safety, um, if I could have the overhead camera turned on. So this is the breakdown of, of uh, the, the county's general fund and what it's spent on. And I can go through quickly verbally what, what each of these uh, pieces of the pie represent. Um, general government, uh, which is about 17.5% of the total general fund is essentially, you know, functions of the auditor, controller, uh, elections, et cetera. Uh, the, the, thank you, Nancy. The assessor uh, in general services. Uh, public protection, which is the biggest portion of this uh, general fund pie. That sheriff, uh, you heard from probation earlier, that's probation, the district attorney's office, and our uh, animal services. 2.6% uh, of the general fund is uh, essentially made up of public ways and facilities, so these are contributions to public works and places like Meadows Field and other airports in the county. 11.4% uh, of the general fund is dedicated uh, to health and sanitation. These are things like public health and a uh, small contribution we provide to Kern Medical. Uh, public assistance is 7.2% of the general fund pie. Those are contributions to general services, or I'm sorry, human services. Uh, Barely uh, 2 percent, 1.9 percent uh, is to education. These are uh, essentially, this is to the library and to uh, other functions like farm and home advisor. And then you've got 2.5 percent of the general fund dedicated to debt service. So 32 counties in the state have a tax rate above uh, seven and a quarter. Kern counties uh, uh, within the unincorporated areas are currently seven and a quarter. 32 counties in the state have a tax rate above that. Uh, the highest in the state is Los Angeles County at 9.5%. Uh, uh, 26 uh, counties in the state, including Kern, have sales tax rates of 7.25. And, and as the sheriff pointed out, four cities within Kern County, uh, Arvin, Delano, Ridgecrest, and Wasco, uh, each have a sales tax rate of 8.25. Uh, percent, and as you know, the city of Bakersfield is proposing to go um, to go to eight and a quarter percent. And as the sheriff pointed out, again, as a matter of background, what the sheriff is proposing today is uh, something that would only be voted on by uh, county unincorporated residents, uh, city of Bakersfield residents. Uh, and other city residents within Kern County would not be uh, voting on this proposal as we understand it. Uh, again, this is unincorporated area residents uh, voting on a uh, uh, one cent increase in sales tax in unincorporated areas to be used for unincorporated area purposes. Um, there was a question uh, asked earlier in the week about other other counties in the area that are above seven and a quarter. Fresno's at 7.9, uh, uh, Tulare 7.75, San Joaquin 7.75, Stanislaus 7.8, and then you've got Santa Barbara 7.75, and then a lot of counties in Southern California above that. Um, Sonoma, Contra Costa, obviously San Francisco and San Mateo uh, up north are, are above that. And then you've got cities in the Central Valley uh, all above eight. Uh, 
most above eight and a quarter of Porterville, Dinuba, Tulare, Visalia, Woodlake, Lindsay, Sanger, Selma, Outwater, Merced, Corcoran. Uh, and there are others. Um, let's see what other background I could provide here. We're happy to answer any questions you might have at this time. Supervisor Couch. Mr. Alsop, you just said something that, that I want to make sure that I'm clear on. And I, this is the way I understand it. Perhaps this, this measure would be voted on by people who live or register to vote, at least, in unincorporated areas would not apply to, no one that lives in a city would, this question would not be on their ballot. Yes, sir. And I thought you just said it would only be used in unincorporated areas, the revenue that would be generated. That's a requirement under <clears throat> which what, me, I, what I believe is being proposed. Well, and I, that's a requirement under what's being proposed or that's a requirement that some sort of state law? Because counties provide lots of services to people that live in cities as well. And the money, money is fungible. So when this revenue comes into the general fund, how do we say it's not being spent on a, uh, a, a restaurant uh, inspection inside a city or it's not being spent on none of the uh, contribution to the behavioral health department is being used? How do you do that? This money would be tracked. I, I think I want to hand it to maybe Mr. Nations to comment on sort of the legality of what's being proposed, and then we could answer any further questions. Uh, Supervisor Couch, through the chair, the Revenue and Taxations Code requires that any revenue from such a tax as being proposed only be used for general purposes within the unincorporated area. The money, as I understand it, uh, through the CAO's office would be uh, put into a separate account within the general fund and tracked to be sure that uh, the, the uses to which the money is uh, put would only be for services rendered in the unincorporated area of the county. Certainly, uh, Ms. Lawson can address uh, the fine points of how that would be done but that is a requirement of the Revenue and Taxations Code. So let me jump in and ask a question there, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Does that, yes, sir. Does that mean that none of the money could be utilized in, for example, the district attorney's office, or they could only be utilized there on cases of someone who was a resident in an unincorporated area who was charged with a crime? Same thing with uh, public defender. We might get more hours in our libraries in unincorporated areas, but not within cities. Is that right? Well, uh, certainly it could be used in, in district attorney's offices that are located in un unincorporated areas. Uh, the, the, the statute simply says that it may be used for general purposes within the area for which the tax was approved by the qualified voters. And so um, how that would be administered out through the, the district attorney's office to be sure that that was done, I'm not sure. But certainly, uh, if there's a district attorney's office located in an unincorporated area, it could certainly be utilized there. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Couch. I have a couple questions as well. Uh, one along those lines is, uh, is one way to look at our general fund, you've given us a pie chart that has uh, an allocation of, by department of how those funds are used. Is there another way to look at an allocation of our funds that demonstrates how our funds are used in the unincorporated areas of Kern County versus the various incorporated areas of Kern County. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, yes, we'd have to uh, put that together and we could for you. So would that, I don't know what that number is going to, to be, what, what the yield from that analysis will be, but uh, is that one way to demonstrate the use of the funds in those unincorporated areas? To, does that meet the, the bar, so to speak, of, 
of the, the mandate that goes along with a, a, an initiative such as the sheriff is, is recommending? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would say yes, it would. Hmm. I'd like you to look at that further to make sure that there's no, no uh, dispute about that. And, and, and who knows what the result will be. I don't, I'm just interested in what that might be. I'm very interested in another aspect of this, uh, and I thank the sheriff for bringing it forward. I think the sheriff, um, as our uh, chief law enforcement officer in all of Kern County, uh, recently reelected by an overwhelming um, majority uh, of the people of Kern County, uh, he uh, enjoys and has earned the support, the overwhelming support of the people of Kern County. When he comes to us and tells us that this is the only way he can see that he can uh, assure uh, to provide the public with the protection they deserve, that is important to me. And uh, it is compelling to me to, to give our citizens an opportunity to vote on that based upon his, his recommendation as our chief law enforcement officer. There are a few questions I have about the process of how it would work. One of the, the criticisms of the City of Bearsville Initiative is that uh, it lacks transparency in its wording with regard to the use of funds to pay for retirement obligations. So in that pie chart that you put up a moment ago, uh, Mr. Alsop, I didn't see retirement obligation in any of those slices of that pie. So can you explain to us how our, uh, the, the retirement obligation that we have in the county, uh, and, and we have a, and I also like you to take a moment to describe, and if, if you're not comfortable with it because you're, you're still relatively new here, I'll take a crack at it. We can have Ms. Lawson or others take a crack at it. But the, the way that uh, pension obligations have been reformed in the county is different than it is in the city. We don't participate in PERS. We have a completely different system than the city of Bakersfield has. But uh, since those pension obligation uh, dollars don't appear to be separately stated in this pie chart, how are they reflected in the various departments than the slices of the pie that you depicted there? Mr. Chairman, I would only tell you that um, reflected in the chart, in that pie chart before you, uh, is the cost of labor. And part of the cost of labor, uh, which is the cost of doing business uh, here in the county, uh, includes pensions, public employee pensions under Kaysera. Uh, that, is, uh, that is part of the cost of paying for firefighters, and part of the cost of paying for sh sheriff's deputies and keeping them on the street, and part of the cost of, of maintaining a workforce. So um, uh, our, our uh, pension uh, costs, as conservative, fiscally conservative as the formula that we currently have is, uh, uh, are included in that pie chart as, as the cost of doing business. And yes, uh, any general uh, uh, purpose sales tax increase uh, would be used in part uh, to, uh, to, to pay for the cost of doing business and labor. Thank you. That is a cost that we are managing now. It is certainly a significant and onerous cost, but we have taken significant measures. Our employees participated with us in helping us provide a plan that will pay for uh, and continues to pay for that, those pension obligations as we go forward. We revised and, and decreased significantly the amount of uh, retirement benefit to employees. We changed a, p a portion of our a retirement benefit from defined contribution to a defined from a defined benefit rather to a defined contribution uh, that si significantly changed our, our, uh, our uh, current and ongoing and future obligation. But um, I wanna make sure that if, if we go forward in this direction and this does go on the ballot, that our language is that describes it as sufficiently clear that there is no uh, criticism that we have, that, that a similar criticism is being made against the city that they have not disclosed that. I want us to disclose that clearly so that the public understands uh, how, how the funds would be used. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I believe uh, from our point of view, from the staff's point of view, we, would, uh, we believe that would be imperative. Um, I'd also like to just point out, um, and something I forgot, if, I, uh, if you give me the opportunity, uh, about you know, there were some comments made about um, our fire recommendation and things. And so I would say regardless of whatever's happening here, uh, this is a proposal the sheriff is bringing in, and um, uh, we're we're uh, trying to provide um, information to the board to make a to make a decision on this. 
I will say that um, from our point of view, we continue uh, on our journey uh, to follow uh, the, the, the mitigation plan. Um, um, uh, somebody mentioned a structural problem over at the city uh, and some of the things the city uh, of Bakersfield has done um, on this. Uh, I can tell you what we've done in the county, uh, and that's uh, in 2016 we cut 5%, 2017 we cut 3.5%, uh, next fiscal year we're proposing to cut 2.5% in, in almost every department. Um, uh, the following fiscal year, uh, the fiscal year after uh, this fiscal year, uh, we'll be proposing to cut again. Uh, we continue on our Lean Six Sigma uh, effort, uh, which was a um, uh, idea of your board. And uh, last report, uh, we were um, had done projects uh, to save about a uh, little over $3 million. Uh, we have lots of projects coming in, flowing into our office, and I know our, up, our, our website's being updated. That, that figure now is $4 million in savings due to Lean Six Sigma and our launch current effort. Those things continue. Uh, our office is dedicated to uh, working with, uh, in negotiations with our fire union. Uh, regardless of what happens here, we continue to, to uh, uh, seek savings. We believe that are needed uh, uh, there. And uh, our, uh, our fire study, uh, I think uh, uh, your, your actions on that and having the chief come before you and the, uh, the deep dive that we're taking and what I believe is a commitment from the chief uh, to, to implement savings there, that, that will continue. Uh, we believe that is uh, something that must continue and must happen, again, irregardless of uh, what happens with this. Thank you. Thank you. Just two more points, and I'll go back to my colleagues. Uh, another significant difference between the city of Bakersfield uh, and all of our, our other incorporated cities in Kern County and the county of Kern is that the county of Kern enjoys the, uh, a role that the, none of those cities have, and that is the role of our independently um, elected auditor controller. That would be Mary Bedard, who does uh, a fine job of, of overseeing and analyzing and assuring us and the public of uh, the, the manner in which our funds are, are uh, expended. So, um, Mr. Alsop, could you speak to that for a moment about the role that Ms. Bedard would have? Uh, and Ms. Bedard, you're welcome to speak too if you like, but I'm not, I'm not compelling you to do that unless you would like to do so. But th that is a distinction in the county versus any of our incorporated cities. So, Mr. Alsop, what will yeah, say about Mr. that? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you. I uh, beg your pardon, Ms. Bedard. Ms. Bedard. Uh, yes, uh, we uh, here in the county have an independently elected auditor um, whose part, part, a big part of uh, the auditor's job is oversight over the county's uh, spending, um, procurement, um, all things that, all, all business operations and um, the, um, Voters have elected uh, Ms. Bernard as their uh, uh, overseer uh, of, of that role, and, uh, and, and that is a, a role unique to the county. Thank you. Lastly, uh, Mr. Nations, could you give us a, a, a clear uh, explanation about how the timing of the deadlines work between now and November when the election were to, to take place? What are the dates by which we must, if we're going to do this, if we're going to place this on the ballot, let the people decide by when must that decision be made? Or is there a deadline? Is there a requirement today? When is the next requirement? When's the requirement after that? Walk, walk us through that, please. The only deadline that really pertains is August 10th. That is the last day that you could order a measure such as this to be placed on the ballot. After that, it would be too late. And uh, our clerk, uh, Kathy Krause, uh, what are the times we're meeting between now and August the 10th? Mr. Chairman, you have one meeting scheduled on Tuesday, July 24th. In addition, you're meeting on Monday, July 23rd, but that's for the purpose to conduct a closed session at 1 p.m. And then you're also meeting that evening at 6 p.m. to hear public comment on the recommended budget. Okay. So the is the only time we're meeting between now and... August 10 on a Tuesday, August, or I'm sorry, July 24? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see uh, another of my colleagues has a question. Supervisor Couch. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what is the proposed duration? Is it? It's not forever. I think it, I think it's 20 years. Is that correct? I don't know that there is that it ever sunsets unless the. Uh, uh, I didn't uh, read that, but I thought I'd heard someone say that. I don't not think today. it sunsets unless the, the the county decides to sunset it. Uh, when you say the county, you mean the board would have to take an action. It may be voters. That? I'm I'm not sure. <clears throat> so, I, Mr. Nations, can you clarify that? The tax would be perpetual unless uh, repealed by the voters. By the voters. Thank you. Okay. Well, that, so I, I think what you're asking us today is a is a is a couple of things. You're asking us, one, do we even want you to bring this back on the 24th to to the for us to decide if we want to do this or not. But are you also asking us, are there elements of this that might we might want included? Or is that not a question for us today? Well, uh, Supervisor Couch, through the chair, if, if, the, if, if it's the pleasure of the board to bring this back, it would be helpful to my office to know if there are elements to it that you want to see included. That would make sense. I don't know what the city of Bakersfield's uh, measure says. Is there, is it, does it have a sunset clause or is it perpetual? It, it, does, it, it does not have a sunset clause. does not. Sheriff, let me ask you, I, I learned something yesterday that I probably should have known, but um, I didn't, I, I knew it, but I didn't know it was to this extent. If you don't know the answers to this, I understand how you might not, but on any given day, how many of your personnel are in the courts, either as bailiffs or working, uh, manning the magnetometers? Do you know? I don't have the number, but they're mandated and th they're not uh, positions that I can cut. I understand. But, and you're also not being, I don't know if the word is, you're not being compensated, you're certainly not being compensated to the full cost. We do get trial court funding and uh, there is a dispute whether we're getting full funding or whether we're not throughout the state. I'm, I'm gonna guess you say you don't think you yeah, are. it's pretty easy <laughs> guess. <laughs> um, well, I mean, they're either giving you enough to cover the cost of, those, of all those folks or not. And that is something I think that ought to be, I mean, I, I get it if they want, if they want uh, sworn personnel there, I understand why but they ought to pay the full cost. And we ought to talk to our legislators about what and that is. And we have civilianized places and throughout the organization that we can. Uh, we actually deleted 55 uh, detention deputies and we're replacing them with civilians in non-contact areas in the, in the jail at a, at a huge cost savings. Uh, we, you know, just over the weekend, we, we had a, a, a deputy in Boron to try and effect an arrest. Uh, he was the only deputy within 20 minutes. Uh, that's how long he had to fight the, the hmm. uh, gentleman for his backup to get there. That, those are things that are, that are uh, uh, this board, I hope, considers. It, it's not just public safety for the public. It's, it's public safety for the officers that are trying to protect us as well. Thank you. Ms. Lawson, I have a question for you. We have some pension obligation bonds that are maturing. And the way I think about these, I've heard Supervisor Scrivener ask about this before, but I want to make sure I'm still thinking about it correctly. I've forgotten the schedule, but the first one doesn't mature for a couple of years. If I'm, is that correct? And then that will free up some money in the budget that is currently being used for debt service. Is that correct? Supervisor Couch through the chair. Uh, currently, we have, I believe it's our 1995 POE that'll pay off a portion in 21 22 and the remaining in 22 23. Um, however, if you may recall, your board is also, in addition to the four year mitigation plan, on a seven year pension um, uh, coverage plan that we are backfilling through reserves to departments currently for uh, the first increase from our our um, uh, rate change from Becerra. Uh So uh, we anticipate that most of that will help to backfill at that time. So that's essentially a wash. Asse that is correct. In okay. addition to in the fire uh, department is in that same position. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other of my colleagues wish to make comment or ask a question or anything about the sheriff's proposal? 
Supervisor Gleason. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I got a bunch of stuff. And uh, let me start off by saying uh, thank you, Sheriff, for uh, being here. And I'm going to bounce around. And not all my thoughts are good. Uh, some of them are bad. And I want to assure everybody before I start opening these lips and start speaking that you understand how much respect I have for you as a person, Donnie, how much respect I have for your department. Anybody wearing a uniform in today's world is a, a hero in my book. And um, so if I say something that seems to be not, you know, as respectful as a person in uniform, as I'm, I think, please take it with, with uh, my apologies up front. And it's not about you, Donnie, personally. It's about uh, uh, just the way we're doing things here. I, I, I'm just not a big fan of this. I, I don't like this. And let me tell you why. I recognize the problem you have. I recognize you have a significant uh, retention problem. I recognize that um, you have a morale issue. You must, or you would not have such a dramatic uh, retention problem. Uh, but for the fact that you say today that if you don't, if we, if I don't pass, this is how I'm hearing it, if I don't pass a vote yes on a one cent tail sta sales tax and I've got like two weeks to do it, uh, then you're gonna close, start closing substations. That is frightening. I don't know how the heck we got to this point. This, um, this is something that I was completely unaware of and uh, it scares me. The fact that we're having a conversation today about putting on a one cent sales tax, where the only consult I've had with you has been a five minute phone conversation, which happened I think last week, and maybe a 20 minute conversation with the CAO, which happened uh, a week and a half ago. Um, and now I'm being jammed here uh, so that I've got a dump on the taxpayer who's already being faced with um, uh, tax measures, fees across the board, um, uh, diesel taxes, uh, every tax you, you look at is just uh, dumping on the taxpayer. And what I'm hearing people say is that the best way to fix this problem is to throw money at it. I don't buy it. I'll just tell you up front, I just don't buy it. Um, we have, um, presently we're halfway through a four year spending plan and I think this county has done marvelously, including the Sheriff's Department. I think we have, uh, you, are, you have been a good partner. We have all been good partners. We have, we, ha we are today, because of that forcing function of having the, the, being mandated to become smaller and take cuts, we are better, we are leaner, we're a better county today than we were three years ago or four years ago when this whole thing started. That's what I know for sure. We have the best, I've worked in large organizations for 30 years, larger than this, and I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the best large organization with the best department heads across the board I have ever been expo exposed to. They're more responsive, they're quicker, they understand, they uh, accommodate, they care for their people, and uh, they care for their customers, and we're getting better. And now if we pass the sales tax, we're taking our foot off the accelerator because we're human beings. And we get this about $35 million coming into our coffers, well, we don't have to struggle as hard. I'm not saying, we, I'm not saying that, that, uh, that we don't need it. I'm not saying we don't have employees that have, have, haven't had a pay raise in nine years. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, certain departments have not completely hit rock bottom and can no, go no further. I'm not saying that, I'm not suggesting that there isn't a bona fide need for a tax increase. I, I guess I, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is I don't like the way this is rolling out. When we did the library tax uh, three years ago, we had 26 town hall meetings, if I remember correctly. 26 town hall meetings. We had an entire year where um, we uh, had debates, public conversations, and we talked about it. And at the end of a very long, tedious, painful process that we went to every corner of the county and talked about things, uh, I felt I voted yes. I think the vote was 3-2. I was one of the persons who voted yes for it. And the reason I voted yes for it was because I believed we'd been transparent. I believed there was a 50-50 chance of that vote passing. So I felt that uh, it was up to me to prevent a well 
nourished idea from being placed in front of the, tax, uh, of the taxpayers and having them give their say. I don't have the same feeling about this because I don't believe transparency exists. I don't think we've vetted this whole deal. I don't, you know, we say, what's the revenue? The well, revenue is going to be about $35 million. Well, what does that mean, about $35 million? I'm sure, that, I'm sure glad that it's not my money that we're talking about. We're talking about the public money, and we seem to be uh, loose-lipped when it comes to, uh, we seem to be uh, not today as, um, let me rephrase that, we need to be more diligent in the public trust. And I don't think we are. We, there's no business plan. I don't see a business plan in front of me to say, okay, 35 million, this dollar's going here, this dollar's going here, we're gonna spend this over here, you're gonna charge this, you're gonna do this. I don't see that. There's no, I don't know where these dollars are going. And to you, for people to think that it's gonna go to a general, general tax and just to whitewash that whole thing and say, it's, oh, it's going to a general tax. We can do whatever we wanna do it. But we expect the lion's share to go to the public safety department. This board's gonna be probably populated by different people in three or four years, and their priorities are gonna be completely different from ours, and it's gonna have no, it's not gonna achieve the desired effect that we want to achieve. Because I'm sitting here with all of you and all my board members, I recognize the problem, I wanna fix the problem, and I wanna support the problem. I just think a tax increase and dumping it on a taxpayer is maybe not the last option to look at, but I'm not, I, I haven't heard that we've gone through a bunch of other steps before we got here. For example, we, have a, uh, we brought up Launch Kern. Launch Kern's a wonderful program. I looked at it yesterday. We have 75 projects underway. We've saved, or we've economized, or saved, the saved is uh, $3.8 million. We have 590 people trained. How many of those 75 projects come from the Sheriff's Department? <coughs> Sheriff, do you have? Okay, I think that's a problem. I think we're not using all, that. I think we should look at ways other than just, just giving it to the taxpayer to find out are there other ways to uh, improve our situation with the, with the Sheriff's Department. We're in a place where oil is going up, it's hovering around $75. We've got a great economy that's going a lot better than it ever has. We have uh, pension obligation bonds that are expiring in just beyond our reach. We have jobs reports. We have more businesses coming in. Uh, things are in a positive way, and I'm sitting here thinking we're going to dump a damp blanket on top of the taxpayer and say all this stuff is good, but we're going to give you these fees over here for the fire department, these fees over here, and here's a one cent sales tax. And I don't mind doing that if it's the last straw, if, it's, if we've vetted all other opportunities to, uh, to save money, to find economies, and to uh, um, have a, a more efficient uh, sheriff's department. I, 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 got a, I, did, so I, I just found out about this with the five minute call. I, you know, I've had it less than a week, but I, I found, I did some research, and I found that California Supreme Court last year passed a, a ruling that says the public, we can have a public, uh, a, a, a public, initiative placed on the ballot, you go out and sign, get the people to sign the ballot, I don't forget what that's called, but an initiative placed on the ballot by the public for a special public safety tax, and that effort would require only a majority vote. It would not require two-thirds. Is that correct, Mr. Nations? Yes, a citizen-initiated uh, measure that qualified for the ballot um, increasing a tax would require, under the most recent authority, as it's being interpreted, a majority vote. So how come we haven't, Mr. Sheriff, how come we haven't done that? I don't know, sir. Why haven't we? I have some responses to... Good. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm, glad, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're here, but, but how about you answer, answer the question? I don't know. Why haven't we? I'm not the only person in this county. You're as responsible as I am for where we're at in this county. This, you said you have, you've had a week with this. This board has heard me for five years telling you where we were going to wind up. And you said you didn't, that I haven't said it, you haven't heard it. That's because you haven't listened, if that's the case. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be offensive, I'm trying to be straight up with you. When we don't have a deputy to send to a substation because we've lost our personnel, the substation closes by itself. I don't have to close it, there's nobody there. 
Um, I have not, I've worked with this county and not gone at issue during budget hearings to not put this board in a tough position to try and help us get through this. And quite frankly, I don't appreciate with, with the, the comments that you made early, earlier on. Um, you say this county's better now than it's ever been. Sir, that may be true in Ridgecrest, but go to East Bakersfield, where I live. Go to, to South Bakersfield, or go to Boron, or go to Lamont, where we're having double homicides, where our homicide rate's higher than it's ever been. And sir, it is not better. It may be in Ridgecrest, but that's your little square area, not the size of this county, and I represent this entire county. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, what I was saying about the county is I meant county functions and procedures and processes and the people that work in the county and how uh, we operate as an organization. We're doing it better than ever. Uh, we have assigned three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back academies. I understand the problems and I'm looking to find solutions, but I had no idea that you were getting ready to close substations if we don't pass a sales tax that I just first heard about within a week. No, if what I said was we won't have deputies to put there. It'll close by itself. Okay. You can have a building, but nobody's going to re respond to that. And if you recall, three years ago, I offered you the opportunity to come in, look at my budget, and help find places to cut. I said it's open to you, and you did not take advantage of that. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, the, the, the plan does not, if, so if it goes to the general, but we still don't know how we're going to spend the money. If we get $38.5 million, we don't know. I don't know what I'm voting on that's going to articulate how we're going to spend the money. If we give a portion of it to the Sheriff's Department, we still don't have control over how he spends that money. He's going to spend the money in the way that he feels best. Is that correct? Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, Supervisor Gleason, if I may have the uh, overhead Back on, please, just to put the chart up. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gleason, uh, the, this pie represents a general fund, and uh, the uh, pieces of that pie are representative of the way your board has decided to spend the money in the general fund, uh, its allocation. Uh, if uh, there were a uh, proposal uh, sent to the voters, uh, and that proposal was a, uh, a penny sales tax increase, and it were to pass, uh, it would generate approximately $35 million. Um, we can, um, uh, Supervisor Gleason, we could provide a, um, uh, an overview of um, sort of an historical look at sales tax. I think that'd probably be beneficial to your board, and we have that. Um, but estimating $35 million, uh, that would essentially make this pie bigger uh, from where it is. And it would uh, allow your, it would give your board $35 million additional dollars uh, to provide toward these services. Um, that, will, that would be your discretion um, as it is each year uh, during budget time. Okay. So uh, we're, we're, I, I, I recognize the problem in the Sheriff's Department and I want to help the problem in the Sheriff's Department. I want to figure out a way how, how we fix the problem and if the tax is the only way to fix the problem, I'm, I'm for it. But I don't know that we have exhausted all other opportunities to fix the Sheriff's Department's budget. I just don't know. I think we, we've held him harmless this year. Quite, am I correct on the budget? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gleason, that's correct. Uh, the, uh, uh, over the last several months in um, uh, holding departments to guideline, the, uh, the sheriff was uh, not able to hold to that guideline uh, in order to keep his department at status quo levels. Thank you. So we've, we haven't done enough. We've got to do more. But 42% of our budget, oh, let me go start this way. Of the 2018-2019 proposed numbers, total county budget is $2.6 million. The sheriff's budget is $225 million, or 8% of the total county budget. The total general fund budget is $771 million, of which the sheriff's budget comprises 42%. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. 
and I take it as uh, seriously as I take my own. It's my uh, my job is to manage the tax dollars like I manage my own, and I know you have the same respect. Yes, sir, I, and I just want to make sure you understand. I'm not asking you to lay this at the taxpayer's feet. I'm asking you to give the taxpayer an opportunity to say yes or no. Thank you. I. Um, we're at getting ready to put this on a, ta on a tax bill on, a, on an election, midterm election, that is going to be, have a repeal of the gas tax. It's going to be a, um, and then we're putting a tax increase on it. How that interfaces with, you know, Bakersfield taxes, tax proposal, all the other taxes within Kern County that we're assessing people or throwing new taxes on people, how this one matches up and interfaces with those and impacts other ability people to get their stuff done. I just don't understand the impacts that uh, this has across the board. And I recognize that in the final analysis of that question, my answer will be, I care more about the sheriff than I care about those. I, I understand that, but I don't see the relationship and I want to see the relationship better. So those are a lot of words. I think I covered much of the stuff. I'm fully committed to um, the sheriff and his uh, retention issues and finding ways to support him wherever I can. I'm 100% behind him and support him as a sheriff and the sheriff's department. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Supervisor Couch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm trying to look down the road and um, by the way, the interchange that the public just saw um, might have looked like it was uncomfortable some, for some. I can guarantee it wasn't uncomfortable for those two guys, and we probably ought to do that more often. So I appreciate the <laughs> candor. I appreciate the candor and just the way you. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I love it myself. We, we actually, we, you know, we might be getting somewhere. Um, you mentioned raises, that, and, and I, we, we all, I think everybody in here agrees. Our deputies are not paid adequately. Um, the reason they haven't gotten a raise recently, at least in my opinion, is because we're in the middle of the problem we're in. But you mentioned that. So, and I think you said that was the top, your top priority, which is fine because you're trying to keep the officers you've got. But I need to know, and I think the public ought to know, if they were to vote for this and if it were to pass, what do you think is needed in the way of a raise to stem the tide of, of your deputies leaving? How much percentage-wise would that be? And how much money would that be? Yeah, I can't tell you, uh, Supervisor uh, Couch to the Chair, wh what that total cost would be, but I've had this conversation with the CAO and with member, uh, board members one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, somewhere between 10 and 15% is going to get us uh, close to what the Bakersfield Police Department makes and close to other agencies, we are the lowest paid in the Southern San Joaquin Valley. And that's why we're, you know, we're dealing with millennial employees who want theirs and want it now. I get it. It's, it's a different employee than we had 25 years ago. I'm not saying better or worse, but that that uh, is a factor in, in these deputies. These deputies are not all leaving because they hate the sheriff. Now, some of them may be, but that's okay. Well, a few. But, yeah, a few. <laughs> but, but the bottom line is, if you're not getting paid and you can make a lot more money someplace else, uh, you're going to go there, and that's, I understand. What and that's what we're seeing. So I don't know what the salary portion of your budget is, but it, if it's going to affect um, pensions, pension costs as well. Um, 10 or 15 percent of your salary component, because I'm assuming it would, be, it would apply to everyone up and down the scale, from you, the undersheriff, down to the Deputy. Well, it won't me, but it will from the undersheriff down, yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, can, you, can you ballpark that number, um, Ms. Lawson? It doesn't have to be perfect. I'm just looking for a, a, a sense of how much of the $35 million do I really think is going to, would, would be required for just a raise. Uh, Supervisor Couch, the chair, if I just ballpark it, oh, it's going to be at least $10 million if they're talking a 10%. Okay. So at 15, it's $15 million? 
Missouri. Yeah, and that's lo that's low. It's not even taking. I'm just ballparking it off the salaries. So you know, there's a the sal the benefit component that's okay. at eighty one point six two percent. Okay. Um. So maybe half by the time you factor everything in. Um. I don't know that I'm for doing. I, I, I mean, I, Sheriff. Let me tell you. Let me tell you something else. I, I want to tell you this: that I think I was. A, and I'll be honest with you. I was a little irritated at first that this was sort of thrust on us. I felt the way Supervisor Gleason did, but I also recognize the position you're in. And if nothing else, it made me start thinking more critically about budgets and things we could do and um, just different approaches to take. And I, I am. I'm glad Supervisor Gleason brought it up, but I had a lot of stuff to say about I was I really hoped that we'd do more Lean Six Sigma stuff and see get the savings and and um, the efficiencies sort of wrung out of that before we did sort of looked at anything like this. I'm I'm pleased with the way we're working through the four year financial plan. I think that was a good uh, plan that was adopted and we're moving through it and we're we're more than halfway done in, in half the time. Where I want to go with this is um, I, I mean I think we just we need to decide if we want this even to brought back to us in two weeks. That's question number one. And we need to decide what we want to what elements we want in the in the question that's put on the ballot if there even is one. I don't. I think you have to have a sunset clause, myself. Um, but let me let me back up for a second. I think we ought to consider. I don't remember what year this was, but the uh, the county attempted a transient occupancy occupancy tax increase. It is not nearly thirty five million dollars. I recognize that, but that is almost all money that comes from outside of Kern County. Um, and I think we ought to be looking at ways. And I recognize that sales tax does some of that to bring money in from outside Kern County. Otherwise, we're just sort of feeding on ourselves. I think our TOT is 6% or is it 8? I think the city of Bakersfield is 12. I don't know what that generates, but if it were, if it's 6 and it was doubled, I don't know what you're getting, 3, 4 million bucks. I think the city gets substantially more than that, maybe 7 or 8. But they have a lot more uh, hotels, probably at higher prices, hotel rooms. I think that's, that is, that is a, uh, a question that I think should be put back on the ballot again, and I would support um, before I would support this. I also think we ought to think about, and I don't even know if, if this is doable. This is my last comment before. Did you guys hear that? Yeah. Sorry. Um, we have had some success with these targeted economic opportunity areas where we're taking a, uh, a baseline of property tax, excluding oil and gas properties, and committing that to that area. I don't know why we can't think about sort of the county on a bigger scale and make a tangible um, take a tangible action that results in a tangible re result that might say, you know, we're going to pick this baseline and anything over that, we're going to devote to public safety. And I, by that, I mean it's police, excuse me, it's sheriff, it's detention officers, it's probation. I don't know how to treat fire if they need to be treated a little bit differently because of the fire fund and the increase that would happen there. Um, I think that's something that we might want to do before we ask the voters to kick in more. That would be not only we all say and we're all, and we all believe it. I think that public safety is our top priority. That would be a way of showing the public not only that it is, but also addressing the funding issue in going forward in those public safety departments. I just threw that at you just now. Is that even? Ms. Lawson, I'm, I'm, asking, I'm looking to you. Is there a way that you could conceptualize that that could be done? Uh, 
Supervisor Couch through the chair, um, I know exactly what you're talking about. I, I think the um, challenge will be that uh, we're still in recovery mode uh, to get to a certain threshold. Um, I know that your board brought that up in previous meetings uh, to not be so reliant, again, on oil and gas, that type of conversation. Um, so I think it would just be uh, based on your board's direction on what the threshold was going to be. Uh, in order to get that calculating um, what you're talking about is um, uh, fairly simple for us to do. Uh, so we can certainly look at that. It's just determining where do you want to, remember these are resources that are currently uh, going to your NGFC allocations right now. Uh, so um, uh, they're being used to balance the, the department's uh, uh, in the current budget and going forward. So uh, if you're going to isolate that growth, it won't be available um, for, well, it won't be available for whatever your board determines that to be. It would not be, if we isolated it just for public safety departments, it wouldn't be available obviously for That's correct. anything else. So if the cost of anything else rose of delivering services in animal control, animal services, they'd see a cut. Correct, unless you um, include them as part of public, the public recipients. Safety. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Scribner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, some folks for the, the comment. Well, everybody, I appreciate everybody's comments that they made today, um, but particularly the concerns were brought up by Mr. Agbalog with current citizens regarding transparency and timing. Um, I think that we're all, um, all frustrated with the fact that um, this timeline that we have here is very compressed. August 10th is um, the deadline where we can make a decision. Obviously, we have a meeting in a couple of weeks and that's our last scheduled meeting. We could do a special meeting, but nevertheless, the, the time frame is, um, is certainly short to make a decision. And also uh, for Mr. Turnipseed, as far as um, you know, the process of the city, of Bakersfield conducted um, the various meetings that they had, et cetera. Um, but I think that the point that the sheriff is, is bringing to us, um, among others, is the fact that the city of Bakersfield's action to put this on the ballot, um, I think in his opinion, has forced his hand. Would you say that that is fair? And so, um, and then the, the concerns that Supervisor Gleason expressed, I think that those are the types of um, criticisms and concerns that, that folks are going to express in opposition to, um, to supporting this proposal from the sheriff. Um, the, you know, the sheriff obviously was just reelected by a large margin and congratulations for that. Um, I think you got about 66% of the vote um, maybe a little more, and um, and I I also think about the folks that are in the unincorporated areas of the county that I represent, like Mojave and Rosamond, um, the outlying areas of Tehachapi. And I, I think the primary concern that I hear from people um, throughout those areas is the um, the fact that they are concerned about the staffing levels of the sheriff's department. Um, we have had lots of different um, community meetings, and that's, that's the issue that's brought up. And so here I am faced with a dilemma because I agree that there are ways in which we can, we can continue to improve the county, um, continue to find ways to save money. Um, we have seen an uptick in oil prices, which is encouraging. However, I'm concerned about the, um, the industry long term in the state of California because of the hostile approach that the, um, the majority party in Sacramento has taken um, towards the oil industry. And so I don't know, um, you know, despite the fact that I support the industry and I want them to thrive, and I, you know, I believe that um, it's, it's a very vital um, part of our economy, um, I do worry about the long-term um, prospects of that industry continuing to um, support the bulk of county operations, which has been the case. And so, you know, Sheriff, if we, if we move forward with this and we direct county council to draft the language, we're going to have, we would have another conversation about this on the 24th. Um, there hasn't been a lot of time for the public to absorb this 
proposal, I think, that you um, proposed this publicly um, maybe a little less than a week ago. Do you remember? A little over a week ago, a over a week ago so somewhere in that. And so this is going to be, um, this will be yours to sell. And I know that there are other county departments that are, um, are likely to benefit if, it's, if, this did, um, if this did pass. But those folks that are out there in Rosamond and Boron and Mojave, um, all the unincorporated areas of the county, Kern River Valley, et cetera, um, I'm, just in, I'm inclined to, to give them a chance to choose on this. And so I'd like to, I'd like to hear from you um, you know, what is, what is primarily your argument going to be when you go out there and you're talking to folks about it? The, the argument is, and, and I'm not trying necessarily to sell this, I want the public to have the opportunity. Uh, when well, you I go, are going to be the chief advocate. I, I, I'm, and I'm willing to and do you're that. you're bringing it forward. I'm willing and, so, to, and I'm willing to do that. But every meeting I go to in Roseman, Boron, uh, Ridgecrest, uh, any substation is that they don't have proper staffing and they're right. They're correct. I don't have deputies that I can give them. We've, we've cut on every area of the department. The only, I mean, we could even close the air unit down and, and would add two deputy sheriffs, which would not, would not be, um, you know, cost effective for what that air unit does for the, for the uh, patrol in, in uh, Metropolitan Bakersfield. But we, we could do things like that. We, we could close entirely all of our narcotic units and assign those deputies to substations. That's not what I think the public wants us to do. Quality of life issues are the calls we get every single day, uh, in not just substations, but in Bakersfield. But, but what I'm gonna tell the public is, this is your opportunity, if you choose to, to help put a Band-Aid on the financial uh, distress that this county has gone through and continues to go through. If uh, I think if Supervisor Couch's idea of a, a sunset five years down the road, I'm, I'm all for that. If we're not out of it in five years, we're in, we're in deeper trouble than what I think. But what I do know is if we don't give the public the opportunity to do this, in the future, I will have no choice but on, during budget hearings to be at issue and present to this board what I need to provide public safety to this county and leave it up to you, yes or no. I don't have any other alternative. I brought this forward to try and help us as a county, as, as, a, 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 as the entire county. All this money, uh, I, don't have, I have no power to designate where any of this money will go. That's entirely up to this board. I can tell you that, uh, that what I need and what I'm gonna ask for, but I suspect that Parks and Rec is gonna be here as well, probation, uh, fire, they're all gonna be here wanting a piece of that pie, and it's up to this board to decide where it's needed and upon recommendation of the county administrative officer. All I'm trying to do is my part as the sheriff to provide public safety and I'm asking this board to allow the public to say yes or no. I'm not asking this board to say yes or no, just allow the public the opportunity to vote and give me the opportunity to go out and sell this program to the constituents of this entire county. I'm willing to give you that opportunity. Supervisor Gleason. I'm not done yet, Chief Sheriff. Sheriff. I'm sorry? I'm not done yet. Well, I, I suspected you weren't. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind, and you don't have to say again, that you did this with the interest of Kern County at forefront and center at what you're thinking and what you want, how you want to go about it. There's no doubt in my mind. Never was. I had a couple questions for CAOs. $35 million, a lot of money. Did we give any consideration to a half-cent sales tax? I mean, how much money do we need? I mean, we're, we're, that, that's what, these are the kind of things that are, are eating at me, or a quarter of a cent sales tax. Supervisor, uh, Chairman Maggard, Supervisor Gleason, um, I gave no consideration to anything. Okay. Uh, this is a Fair proposal enough. being brought by the sheriff. Fair enough. I understand. Yes, sir. Um, have we exhausted all AB 109 uh, funding mitigations? that we can possibly, remember, you know, AB 109s cost us tons of money and they, the state reimburses us so much money, we're always bottom of the barrel for AB 109 refunding. Have we, I mean, reimbursements? Do we know, have we looked at that? S Supervisor, uh, Chairman Maggard, Supervisor Gleason, if we could come back to you on that item. Uh, I don't okay. have a Fair enough. great answer for I that. I have other questions too. I need a business plan. 
before I vote yes, I need to know how much money we need and how, where it's going to go, how it's going to spend, and why we need it. I believe the sheriff is saying, and t correct me if I'm wrong, sheriff. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm hearing you say that your, our sheriff's department is at serious risk without passing this, this sales tax. Is that a correct statement? Absolutely. Okay. I'm, uh, I, I'm sitting here, Sheriff. I, I, uh, um, I want to make sure that we exhaust all possibilities. We have two lousy weeks. Go ahead, or maybe till August 10th. Go ahead, say that again. Is Thank that you, again, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gleason. I just wanted to address uh, something uh, you've mentioned it a couple of times, and I think it's important for this board to to, um, to understand uh, the recommendation that we provided you on our budget uh, does in fact hold the, um, uh, it does not cut the sheriff's department. That was a decision and we recommended that to your board. Um, I do want to let you know is uh, if, if the sheriff's department would have taken the two and a half percent reduction, uh, he would be having to cut nearly three million dollars out of his budget. Um, and that does not include the academy uh, that this budget is paying for of 1.3 million. So that's a grand total of 4.4 million dollars uh, that uh, uh, I, I think the sheriff articulated why he, why he needs to, to have the academy. But it gives you a sense of um, the amount of money that would have been required uh, for that cut and and. Uh, on top of that, the sheriff, uh, along with all other departments, next year will be required to take uh, a reduction uh, to uh, comply with our mitigation plan. I, I like uh, what Supervisor Couch said about a sunset clause. I need a business plan. Uh, I need to know that we're exhausting all other retention issues, Sheriff, with the, every other possible avenue to help you with your retention issues. Have we exhausted all our AB19 Supporting mitigate, I mean all that reimbursable stuff, and uh, why a one cent sales tax? Now why not a half cent sales tax? If I get those questions answered, um, I, I wanna, I'm gonna support because uh, I respect the sheriff and I respect um, what he says and I respect the sheriff's department. But I'm a long way from voting yes on the 24th. I need some, I need some numbers. I need a game plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gleason. The uh, question before us today is whether or not we should refer to County Council the drafting of language that would pose the question to this board, should a sales tax initiative be placed before the voters in November? The question before us today is should it be referred to Council? I believe it should be referred to Council. Uh, I, I, think, I just want to emphasize a point that I think is, is fundamental in this. We are at a time when it appears that the citizens of the city of Bakersfield may very well want to vote themselves an additional sales tax. If those polls, if those predictions are accurate, and if that city of Bakersfield sales tax initiative passes, there is a very serious issue about parity, about, about um, whether or not there will be consequences in the county's public safety division that will imperil the public. That's a real serious question for the, for the public to have to consider. That's one of the reasons why I think the timing is such that the question should be posed to the county taxpayer. I want to make sure this is crystal clear to everyone from county council. Uh, Mr. Nations, if, the, uh, if a member of our community of Kern County lives within the city of Bakersfield, uh, lim city limits of the city of Bakersfield, and if both the city's initiative is on the ballot and the county of, the county of Kern's initiative is on the ballot, Will that city of Bakersfield resident only have one sales tax initiative before him, and will that be the city's sales tax initiative? That's correct. And if a uh, citizen that lives in the unincorporated area of Kern County uh, were to have posed to them the question of whether or not they should impose upon themselves a 1% sales tax, would that only be the county's question posed to them on their ballot if they're a county resident? That's correct. So it is, there, well, there will not be two sales tax initiatives on anyone's ballot because depending upon where you live, you will only pay one or the other. That's correct. Thank you. I think that's important to, 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 to um, make sure it's understood as well. I absolutely do not think we should let up the pressure. We should keep our foot firmly pressed to the floor on our momentum to uh, find every cost savings and every efficiency in the county. We have 
been driven to that, I think, by, by this, uh, by, the, by the circumstances that we're in. And while we have uh, made great strides in diversifying our economy into renewable energy and into logistics, we are not only, uh, we're we just at the, the kind of the burgeoning beginning of our emphasis on diversifying our economy in the area of logistics because of where we are placed at the hub of transportation as we are. Uh, we, we are doing a great deal to diversify the sources of revenue to our, to our, uh, our local economy. But that doesn't change the fact that if this city of Bakersfield sales tax passes and there is not a viable alternative for uh, the, the county of Kern residents, then I think we have a, a serious parity issue. It is without a doubt, there is no ambiguity about this. When I am in the store, when I am walking uh, to a game on a, a local sports facility. As I walk through the parking lot at church, it, wherever I am in our community, last night in a pizza parlor having a birthday party for one of my writing buddies, the, the issue that is before us is, uh, hey, what are we gonna do about homeless? Hey, what are we gonna do about our streets? Hey, I, I, I'm, I'm a, it, it, I, could, I couldn't get somebody to come to my house when I had to make a call for service for uh, some, some, you know, the, my car was broken into or there was somebody that was prowling around the neighborhood. The, those are very serious concerns for our public. And I think we have uh, a responsibility to allow the taxpayers to decide if they want to tax themselves a 1% uh, increase in sales tax to help cover those costs. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do all the things that Supervisor Gleason is concerned about or that Supervisor Couch has brought up. I've, I'm not gonna belabor those and, and repeat them all now. I do think we should, we should be sure of that, uh, that, we are, that we are as efficient and cost effective as we can be, and I have no intention of slowing down uh, in that effort. But the question that's before us today is, do we refer to Mr. Nations the uh, job to bring back to us on July the 24th uh, the language that might be posed on the, on the ballot? And I think it is uh, prudent for us today to uh, following the sheriff's suggestion, um, ask for that language to be proposed. Uh, so I've, I asked for uh, some language about transparency. Supervisor Couch asked for some language about uh, a sunset clause. I don't know if others have that, but if you do, I, I would hope that you would make those that clear now. And if you don't have other language you'd like him to propose, I would hope that someone would make a motion that we refer this task to county council so we can bring back language to us and then we can decide uh, as, we, as we move forward whether or not this should be placed on the ballot. Supervisor Couch. I wanna ask one additional question. When this comes back, it's my understanding this takes a two thirds vote of the board to place it on the ballot? That is correct. Does that mean it takes four votes? That is correct. Thank you. Regardless of how many members of the board are here, it takes four votes. That's correct. It's two thirds of the entire board. Yeah. It's an important distinction. It takes three votes today to refer it to staff. It will take four votes on the 24th if it gets that far to uh, place it on the ballot. Any other comments by the CAO? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, since you gave me the opportunity, I would only add that, uh, you know, in whatever your direction will be to County Council, I would recommend just as the, uh, the, the uh, group of folks that are watching the, uh, the budget that the board consider in, in, uh, in its consideration of things to add or um, sunset dates or things like that to consider the fact that uh, we want to avoid um, uh, at all possible, um, taking um, essentially the concept of one-time revenues and spending those one-time revenues on ongoing, uh, increasingly elevating costs uh, in the county. That would be my only comment. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Sheriff Youngblood. Do you have any other comments before we consider uh, whether or not to refer it to staff? No, sir, I don't. Thank you. Supervisor Couch. Mr. Olson, can you expand on that? I don't know quite what you meant by that. 
I know what you meant, but what were you referring to? Yeah, I just was referring to if this board were to consider a um, with the four votes and consider and it and it goes before the voters and they pass it, uh, generating approximately thirty five million dollars in revenue for the county, and that is spent on things like more sheriff's deputies uh, on the streets, uh, among other things. Um, and then that goes away uh, in five years. That's problematic. I, I would agree with the CAO. When I said that a few minutes ago that I wouldn't have a problem, I, I would agree that we would not want to put this board in that position not knowing what five years down the road is going to look like. Thank you, Sheriff. I think that an interesting question for us, let's discuss this for a few moments, and that is if there is a sunset clause in this, should it be five years? Should it be 10 years? Should it be 20 years? How long should that sun sunset be? Five years is a pretty near-term horizon. Uh, and I, I too, uh, share the concern that I don't like taxes, and I uh, don't like more taxes, and I want government to be as efficient as it can be, and I don't want to enable it to, to spend recklessly by giving it more money. Um, but at the same time, uh, I, I think if we're going to do this, we should be prudent about how long should the horizon be. So wh what are your thoughts, colleagues? Is, is five years a date? That, that's just what somebody pulled out of the air. I think it was the sheriff. I think you said five years. Apologize. Yeah. <laughs> sheriff apologized for that off mic. Um, what, what, what do you believe? Is, is a 10-year horizon? Is a 20-year horizon? What do you think is a, a, a term that is reasonable if there were to be a term, or do you prefer no term at all? Well, Mr. Chairman, I'd offer that we have two weeks to mull that over. Um, but I know that we need to give some direction to council, but that's something, regardless of what Mr. Nations puts in the proposal, we can tweak it um, when it comes day. before us on the 24th. And so we could, I mean, we could sit here for an hour trying to figure out if it's 5, 10, 15, 20, or no, no term at all. Um, and so I, I would suggest that, that we, um, give the board, give all of us an opportunity to think, to think that over since that's something that the city doesn't have in place. And I think that the, to me, the real issue here is that if the city passes theirs, then it puts our sheriff's department at a competitive disadvantage. And so I think that we need to consider that in the context of a sunset clause if there is none for them. And I know we can, you could continue to go back to the voters after, after it sunsets and I, I'm not, um, totally opposed to the idea, but I'd, I'd like to have an opportunity to think that over long and hard um, on what would be the best approach. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Couch. I think there was comment made earlier, I think it was by you maybe, that we have an auditor controller. Her function uh, would serve as oversight. Is that what you were referring to? Yes, I, I said that a unique distinction between us and the city is that our auditor controller serves as a, a form of oversight. As opposed to the city, they don't have that, therefore they need some sort of, or it's beneficial to have an oversight committee there that reviews, or is that, is that I, what? I didn't intend to speak as to whether or not the city needs one, I just was stating that the county has an oversight function that the city oh, does not it sounded, have. It sounded to me like you knew that they had one and we didn't need one because we have an auditor oh. controller. That's not what you were saying. Uh, no, I just said we have a, we already okay. have a form of oversight. Um, while I agree that Ms. Bedard does an excellent job of oversight, I think if we're going to put this, if this goes to the voters, I think it's important to have um, a group of the voters' peers that are part of the oversight. And you can you can say that well, Mr. Turnip seats here every meeting. He's the he's the oversight. But I think it's. Um, I would, I would just submit that I think that's an important element of this. Thank you. Again, an issue that we can formalize on the 24th, if, it, if, it, if we ever get a motion to refer it to staff to draft the language to bring back to us on the 24th. Is there a motion? I'll move. I'll make that motion. With um, Mr. Nations, I, I know we, were, we weren't real clear as far as the different um, provisions that we want in there. Um, is there anything that you feel like you need clarity on right now in order to start drafting? This is uh, like making sausage, as they say. Um, what I've heard is transparency, possible sunset clause, possible citizen oversight. 
Um, other than that, I don't believe so. Okay. I, I think along with this motion, we should, uh, I, I believe it should be assumed that there's direction to the CEO staff to come up with much of the analysis as you can uh, as to the questions that were posed by Supervisor Gleason about the plan, how, you know, explain more how the money would be spent um, that would be incumbent upon the CEO's office to comply with Supervisor Gleason's concerns. Is there a second to that motion? Chairman can make a second, can he not? Yes. Chairman seconds. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved, four ayes, one absent. Supervisor Perez. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, is that the last item we have before us this morning? Yes. I said at the beginning of the meeting that we were gonna close the meeting in remembrance of someone. I noticed in the paper this morning that former Kern County Sheriff Al Lustelow passed away on the 4th of July. And uh, he served our county well with distinction and with honor and uh, spent his life protecting our citizens. So I would like us to close our meeting this morning in remembrance of former Sheriff Al Lustelow. Thank you. We'll re reconvene at 2 p.m. <laughs>